two men. Two philosophies. Two choices. One decision. You decide. We hope you enjoy this uh, particular videotape of the debate I did against Professor William Moore at the uh, University in Detroit at Wayne State University. Dr. Moore has received well over a million dollars in grants to study evolution. He has taught the subject for over 30 years at uh, university level. He is considered one of the experts on the evolution topic, and I was very honored that he would be willing to debate on this topic in front of uh, students. I was also a little disappointed, I guess, that the week before I came, they had, uh, the university, different groups there had gotten together and paid Stephen Gould, I heard, $15,000 to come in and speak on the evolution topic. And for the entire hour and a half, all he did was to blast creationists and Christians. And when a Christian or creationist tried to ask Dr. Gould a question, he would simply avoid them and go on to somebody else. Several of my friends were in the audience and told me it was uh, certainly not done fairly at all. And I'd be very willing to debate Dr. Gould or any other professors on the evolution topic. But here uh, you will see, as uh, Dr. Moore, uh, one of the world's experts on evolution, <clears throat> debated against me in front of a packed crowd there at Wayne State University. We hope you enjoy this debate. I want to thank Dr. Moore for coming. Uh, it's, I think, only fair that students see both sides of such an important topic as the origin of man, the origin of the universe, where we came from. And I am honored to be here. I will tell you right up front my position, where I'm coming from. I believe the Bible to be the infallible, inspired, inerrant word of the living God. I believe it from cover to cover. I even believe the cover, says Kent Hovind. I believe that. And I uh, didn't, didn't always believe that, but the more I study this, the more convinced I get. Now, this is not a debate between science and religion. Both views, creation and evolution, are religious. You must believe in quite a number of things to be a creationist, and you must believe in quite a number of things to be an evolutionist. Neither is going to be provable scientifically. Now, what you believe, though, is extremely important. This topic is, I think, of critical importance. What you believe about origins will shape the way you make decisions on subjects like abortion, premarital sex, infanticide, euthanasia, socialism, communism. Folks, somebody is wrong. In one of these two worldviews is, is wrong, and it has, I think, tremendous effects on the way you live and on your eternity. Your eternity may depend upon this. So please keep an open mind as we share the evidence for creation, and he shares the evidence for evolution and you make your decision. The Bible tells us in 2 Peter chapter 3, knowing this first, there shall come in the last days scoffers. There are people who scoff at the Bible, who don't think it's true. And the Bible says they're going to say, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were. That's uniformitarianism. All things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. And it says they are willingly ignorant of how God made the heavens and how the earth was in the water and out of the water, and they're ignorant of the flood. The world was overflowed with water. Two different major events in history, the creation of the world and the flood, which the scoffers are willingly ignorant of. They purposely don't want to believe in those two things, and I think there's a reason. If God created the world, that means there might be some rules. Are. Secondly, if there was a worldwide flood and they admit to that, then that means God has the right to judge his creation. And he does. This is his world. He can wreck it if he wants. And he's coming to wreck it again, folks, pretty soon. I like that bumper sticker. said, Jesus is coming, and boy, is he mad. Well, the Bible starts off and says, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. It's just a matter-of-fact statement. This is the way it happened. Now, you can choose to believe that or not, but we're going to try to examine the evidence. Shortly thereafter, a couple chapters later, Satan came to Eve in the Garden of Eden according to the story in the Bible. And Satan said to the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Question. First thing he did was question God's word. Second thing he did was to deny it. He told Eve, You will not surely die. And the third thing he did was to deify mankind. He said, Eve, if you eat off that tree, ye shall be as gods. And I contend that right there is where the whole idea of evolution got started. It didn't start with Charlie Darwin. It started with Satan in the Garden of Eden. He wants you to believe we are slowly evolving toward Godhood. And here's why. If the creation story is true, 
then man is a fallen creature and he needs a savior. But if the evolution story is true, we are not a fallen creature. We are an evolving creature. We're getting bigger and better. Someday we're going to be God ourselves and sail around the universe and discover new life forms like Star Trek. These two worldviews are polar opposite. They couldn't be more different, and there is no compromise between the two. Adolf Hitler said, if you tell a lie long enough and loud enough and often enough, the people will believe it. I think that's what's happened, folks, in our textbooks. I taught science 15 years. I have a gigantic collection, hundreds of public school textbooks from just about every major publisher, even from many countries, from many grades. There's lots of good science in the textbooks, okay? I like science. Don't accuse me of being against science. The problem is we've got some poison mixed in with the science. Did you know beer is often sold at football games? Beer has nothing to do with football. And beer does not become athletic by association with the football. And evolution is often included in the science books, but that doesn't make it part of science. Evolution is a religion included in with the science books, and it has nothing whatsoever to do with it. The two basic views of history are this, and my timeline right here behind me, same thing. The Bible teaches that about 6,000 years ago, God created the heavens and the earth. Did it in six days, fully formed, fully mature creation. 4,400 years ago, or 2,400 B.C., there was a flood that destroyed the world. Noah built the ark and saved all the critters on board. 2,000 years ago, Jesus came, died on the cross, paid for our sins, and rose from the dead, and is alive forevermore. Here we are today, waiting for the Lord to come back in a few minutes, and uh, straighten out this mess. The evolution view is very different. They think it all started 20 billion years ago with a big bang. The Christians believe, in the beginning, God. The evolutionists believe, in the beginning, dirt. Matter just created itself, or is eternal. The only two choices, either it created itself, or it, it itself is eternal. So. These two views, these two worldviews are, like I said, just simply polar opposite. Somebody's wrong. Now, if I was to make my bottom timeline representing 20 billion years, the same scale as the top one, in order to do that, the line would have to be 2,100 miles long. I don't want to carry a chart that big, so I made a new scale, all right? So it's huge. But in school, the teachers are told in the teacher's edition to be sure to stress that the earth is billions of years old. Because that is the first thing the evolutionist must have is billions of years. And I think there's overwhelming evidence that it's not billions of years old. But even if it is, there are still lots of obstacles the evolution theory must overcome, which I want to try to share some with you. This textbook author said, nothing really means nothing. This guy's real smart. He said, not only matter and energy would disappear, but also space and time. However, physicists theorized that from the state of nothingness, the universe began in a gigantic explosion, the Big Bang. This guy says 16.5 billion years ago. Some say 20. It varies all the time. But according to the evolution theory, as I understand it, and from reading hundreds and hundreds of textbooks on this topic, 20 billion years ago, there was a Big Bang. I like to ask the question, what exploded and where did it come from? And where did the energy come from? Where did the laws come from? I mean, the universe is governed by laws, centrifugal force, inertia, gravity. Where did the laws come from? Who's the lawgiver? None of those questions are ever answered. They are all assumed. They are all believed in, which is why I would stress the evolution theory is a religion. Now, I don't care if you want to believe in it. That doesn't bother me. I don't care what you believe in. But I'm sick and tired of them using my tax dollars to spread their religion in our school system. That's all I'm sick of. Now, according to the creation view, though, it's very different. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. 4,400 years later, there was a flood. Noah built the big ark, took everything on board, including the dinosaurs, I believe. Creation view is very simple. God made everything in six days. All the animals, all the plants, dinosaurs, everything. Along came the flood. Noah took two of each kind, seven of some, but two of each kind on board the ark. He didn't have to bring two of every variety, just two of each kind. And he probably brought babies. He was smart enough to figure that out. Just be sure to get a pink one and a blue one. And... And then after the flood, I think the dinosaurs died off because of the climate change and people killing them, calling them dragons back in those days. And I cover all that in my seminars on dinosaurs and how they fit right into the Bible and how there might be a few stragglers still alive today, which is why there have been so many sightings like Loch Ness Monster type thing like that. Um, the Bible says the animals are going to bring forth after their kind, not species. Darwin's book, The Origin of Species, is not the argument. By the way, he never does discuss the origin of species in The Origin of Species, but... The origin of kinds would be the argument. The Bible says they bring forth after their kind. God told Noah to bring two of every sort onto the ark. For instance, today there are 250 varieties of dogs in the world. 
I was asked to come speak at this college in Boston one time. They said I could do a, a speak on creation if their teachers could ask me any questions they wanted. So I got my timelines out, and I, there were six professors and all their students in the room. Uh, as far as I could tell, all of them were believed in evolution. And I got my charts out, and I said, folks, I believe that about 6,000 years ago, God created everything. 4,400 years ago, there was a flood, destroyed the world. Noah saved two of each kind on board the ark. And then I shared with them what they believed. 20 billion years ago, there was a big bang. This is in just about every textbook there is. I mean, I can show it to you in 100 of them if you'd like. And then 4.6 billion years ago, the earth cooled down and formed a hard, rocky crust. And it rained on these rocks for millions of years. This textbook says, as earth formed, the surface was similar to the moon today. The surface was hot and there were large pools of bubbling lava. But it rained on the rocks for millions of years and formed oceans. This is what the textbooks teach the kids. Millions of years of torrential rains created great oceans. And in these oceans was a swirling uh, broth of complex chemicals. Progress from a complex chemical soup to a living organism is very slow. Yes, it is. Totally stopped. Doesn't happen at all. That's how slow it is. Well, one of the professors in the crowd was getting really upset about that time, and he said, uh, Mr. Hoven, there are 250 varieties of dogs in the world today. I said, I never counted them, but I'll, I'll, I'll believe you. He said, you think all those dogs came from two dogs off of Noah's Ark? I said, sir, would you look at what you're teaching your students? You're teaching your students that all the dogs in the world today came from a rock. One lady was so angry after this, she says, we do not believe we came from a rock. I said, well, where do you think you came from? She said, we came from a macro molecule. I said, where did that come from? She said, well, from the oceans. There was minerals in the oceans. I said, where did those minerals come from? She said, well, it rained on the rocks for millions of years, and it finally dawned on her, wow, I do believe we came from a rock, don't I? <laughs> I don't care if you want to believe that. Honestly, that's fine. But don't call it science. That's not science. That's a fairy tale. Textbook says, humans evolved from bacteria four billion years ago. This one shows the kids a starfish and says, 3.4 billion years old, the remains of the early ancestors of modern human beings. Now look, you're welcome to believe that, but don't call it science. That's part of a religion. This textbook shows the kids a tarsier and says, 30 million years ago, these creatures evolved. Now folks, that word evolved right there, that has two different meanings, and the entire argument today and every other day on this topic is over the two different meanings of the word evolution. And we'll cover that in just a second. But if you straighten out what that word means, the argument is over. One meaning of the word is indeed scientific, no question. And the other meaning is indeed religious, with no evidence to support it. But the textbook says we've got evidence for evolution. I mean, kids are taught whole chapters, sometimes whole units, just on this topic. Sometimes entire courses at college are devoted to the evolution uh, philosophy. What happened in the early 1800s, some guys got together, primarily Charles, Charles Lyell, who wrote this book, but building on the work of Strata Smith and Steno and Cuvier and some other guys, they developed the geologic column. They said each of the layers of the earth is a different age. This was all done in the early 1800s. Each of those layers was assigned an age way before there ever was any carbon dating, potassium argon dating, rubidium strontium dating, lead 208 lead dating, long before any radiometric dating. The layers were assigned an age based upon the assumption that evolution has happened. It all is based on evolution assumption, and that's how the geologic column got started. Now, there were some creationists involved in that who thought that maybe God created the world many times, multiple creations. Well, they're simply wrong. But all of this um, geologic column is based on circular reasoning. This textbook shows on page two, 306 that they date the rocks by the fossils. On the next page, it says you date the fossils by the rocks. And this happens all through. The geologic column, this, like this textbook says, if there were a column of sediments, unfortunately no such column exists. The geologic column only exists in the textbook, and it's all based on the circular reasoning. That's how things are dated. The intelligent layman has long suspected circular reasoning in the use of rocks to date fossils and fossils to date rocks. The geologist has never bothered to think of a good reply, feeling the results, explanations are not worth the trouble as long as the work brings results. They know it's based on circular reasoning. But those layers are, cannot be different ages. I can show you hundreds of pictures, if you want to take the time, of petrified trees standing up, running through multiple layers of rock strata. The tree did not stand there for millions of years, and it didn't grow through hundreds of feet of solid rock looking for sunlight. It was formed during a worldwide flood. The flood formed those layers. But this fellow, Charles Darwin, the author of this book, 
set sail on board the Beagle in 1831. He was going to sail around for five years. He brought with the book by Charles Lyell. That book destroyed his confidence in the Bible. Darwin came back a skeptic, a scoffer. After 30 years of coaching by Charles Lyell, Darwin finally wrote his book, Origin of Species, which has a much longer title, by the way, we can get into later. And that book changed Darwin's life for good. Later, he claimed to be an atheist. As Charlie sailed around the coast of South America, he came to Ecuador, the islands of Ecuador, called the Galapagos Islands, right here. There on these islands, Charlie observed there are 14 varieties of finches. He studied the birds carefully. They all had different beak shapes. Some were bigger than others. They were all finches, but different, uh, different kinds of finches. Charlie studied them for quite a while, collected quite a huge number of them, and said, you know what? I think all of these birds had a common ancestor. I bet you're right, Charlie. A bird. And then he said, maybe this proves that birds are related to bananas. <laughs> what? No, no, no. Page 170 of his book, he said, all forms of life on earth, all plants, all animals have a common ancestor. Page 170. What he saw is what we sometimes call microevolution. Now, this is the entire debate right here. Microevolution is one meaning of the word, which is say, basically saying that dogs produce a variety of dogs, roses produce a variety of roses. Nobody argues with that. Microevolution is a fact. It is scientific. It is observable. That's what farmers do for a living. They try to make that happen. They try to get a better species of whatever they're raising for their area. And the animals do have a wide range of adapt, uh, adaptations they can, they can take on. But these adaptations have limits. Farmers have been trying to get bigger and bigger pigs for a long time. But they'll never get a pig as big as Texas. There's a limit in there someplace. Roaches eventually become resistant to pesticides. No question about that. But there's a limit. Two things you need to understand. The resistance to the pesticide was already in the roach population. Maybe just a small percentage of it. And when you do end up with a re resistant population of roaches, you're sw swimming in the shallow end of the gene pool now for the roaches. Next thing you need to understand, there's a limit to this resistance. They might become resistant to these pesticides, but they will never become resistant to a sledgehammer. <laughs> so, yes, there's variations. No question. I agree. That happens. But what, the, what happens then is the professors try to make the students see thousands of examples of microevolution, which is indeed a science. And they try to make them make a giant leap of faith and logic into believing that that somehow magically is evidence for macroevolution. Macroevolution says all life forms have a common ancestor. The dog and the rose are related, ultimately, to a rock. Now, macroevolution is a religion. This is assumed. It has never been observed. Nobody's ever seen a dog produce a non-dog. Now, if somebody wants to believe dogs came from non-dogs, you can believe that, but that's not science. That's your religion. It's based on imagination. It's fantasy. You might get a big dog and a little dog, and they're still related. And except for a few mechanical problems, they're still interfertile. They could produce a dog. See, maybe even the dog and the wolf and the coyote are related. Okay, boys and girls, we have a dog, a wolf, a coyote, and a banana. Which one is not like the others? <laughs> and a three-year-old can tell you. They're still the same kind of animal. Probably the horse and the zebra are related. I wouldn't argue about that. Stand 30 feet away and look at it. It's obviously not a banana. We're dealing with the same kind of animal here, folks. So the whole problem is, as I've seen it in my debates, and I do thousands of radio and TV talk, call and talk shows, the evolutionists always are able to give hundreds of examples of microevolution. And then they want you to believe that this somehow proves macroevolution. And students are deceived by this by the thousands every day because the professor says, well, look, we see this, you know, you know, these rabbits became resistant to these pesticides. Or the rats, you know, we got the super rat in Chicago became resistant to the pesticides. Well, yeah, still a rat. It's not evolution, folks. It's a variation. It's microevolution. Don't be confused by that. Uh, textbook, though, says mutations provide the source of variations. Well, this is true. But the mutations are harmful, fatal, neutral, or if you do get one that's beneficial, which nobody's really proven a good beneficial mutation, that can be take over the population. You know, who's this good beneficial mutation character going to marry? And then who are its kids going to marry? I mean, anything's going to be back, blended back into the population. Here's a short-legged sheep. 
textbook says this mutation would not last in nature. Of course not, man. He's the first one the wolf is going to catch. Textbook says natural selection causes evolution. Nothing could be further from the truth. Creationists have nothing against natural selection. We thought of it first. Natural selection is sort of like God's quality control. I worked in Pontiac, Michigan for two years at the truck and coach plant up there when I was going to school. We built trucks. They came down the assembly line. When it got to the end, somebody checked it. Quality control. If it didn't work or something was wrong, it was rejected. That's normal. Every factory has a quality control. Now, suppose you had a quality control section that was eagle-eyed. They caught every mistake. They did, nothing got by those guys. How long would it take that process to change the truck to a helicopter? You say, it'll never change it to a helicopter. Precisely my point. And natural selection will never change an animal to a new kind of animal. It'll only keep the species strong. And it might allow the species to adapt to a new environment. We now have Alaska rabbits that are able to survive in 20 below zero. And we have Florida rabbits that are able to survive in 100 degrees. And they are not interfertile. They're considered a different subspecies, maybe even a different species. I don't know. Now, both of those Alaska rabbits and Florida rabbits can breed with Minnesota rabbits. They're kind of in the middle. Okay. And they're going to say, see, this is evolution. No, it's a variation, and it's still a rabbit. That doesn't prove we came from a rock, folks. That's just a variety. That's all it is. And that's all that can ever be offered is examples of variation. For instance, the fruit fly experiment we did in biology class many times. They raised flies in the laboratory. They nuked them. They microwaved them. They x-rayed them. They got those flies to have mutated babies, curled wings. They fly around, couldn't go anywhere. They got flies with no wings. What do you call that? A crawl? Can't fly. <clears throat> But they always got a fly, and it was always worse off than great-great-great-great-grandpa fly. But that's always given as an example for evolution. They show the kids the peppered moth as evidence for evolution. Most, most of the moths in England, they went around and counted them on the trees. Must have been a government project. They discovered it was 95% light-colored moths, only 5% black. Then they burned coal in the factories for a while, and the trees turned black, and the population shifted to 95% black moths. They said, wow, look at this, evolution. The white moth evolved to a black moth. No, 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 no. You see, the black and white variety was already in the gene pool. They never did get a pink one or a purple one. The genetic information was already there. All they got was a, a shift in the population ratio. And when they quit burning the coal in the factories, the trees turned white again, and the moths shifted right back to light-colored moths. And this is considered one of the best examples known for evolution, industrial melanism. Started off a moth, it ended up a moth. That proves we came from a rock, boys and girls. Write that down, that'll be on the test. <clears throat> they show the kids different forelimb structures of the animals. Two bones in the wrist, the radius and the ulna. The whale has two bones, the radius and the ulna. They're going to say, see, boys and girls, you can compare the forelimbs of all these animals, and comparative anatomy provides further evidence of evolution. The commonality suggests these and other animals are all related. They probably evolved from a common ancestor. Uh, excuse me. Might be two ways to look at that. That might prove they have a common designer. Hmm? Did you know the lug nuts from a Chevy will screw onto a Pontiac? That proves they both evolved from a Honda 38 million years ago. <laughs> what we have here, folks, is an example of good observation and bad conclusions. Maybe you heard the story about the scientists were going to see how far the frog could jump. They set the frog down and said, jump, frog, jump. Frog jumped 80 inches. Brought him back, cut off one leg. Jump, frog, jump. He only jumped 70 inches. Brought him back, cut off another leg. Jump, frog, jump. He only jumped 60 inches. Brought him back, cut off his third leg. Jump, frog, jump. He only jumped 50 inches. Brought him back, cut off his last leg. Said, jump, frog, jump. Frog didn't jump. He said, jump, frog. Frog didn't jump. They concluded, every time we cut a leg off, the frog jumped less. Therefore, we feel that when you take all four legs off of a frog, he goes deaf. <laughs> Now look, you got a good observation, but that's the wrong conclusion, all right? And the commonality of the forelimbs of the animals is a good observation. I agree with that, but it's not a good conclusion to conclude they have a common ancestor. They got a common designer. Very few things anger me about the evolution theory more than this idea of the human embryo having gill pouches. Made up by Ernst Haeckel in 1869, proven wrong in 1874. He faked the drawings of the embryos, made up a phrase, ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny. 
It was proven that he lied. There's the real pictures of these embryos compared to his drawings up above. I mean, it was a total fraud. He finally confessed to fraud at his own university. They had a trial against one of their professors. He confessed to drawing from memory and was convicted of fraud at the University of Jena, 1874. But the idea of ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny, or the human embryo having gill slits, or going through the stages of evolution during development, is still in textbooks today, and I guarantee it's in this university right now, proven wrong 125 years ago. I was going through some stuff in the textbooks that's not true one time, and one professor said, well, what would you replace it with? What he was trying very hard to not say is, <clears throat> we want the kids to believe this evolution, and these are the only examples we have, and if you take these away, they might not believe in evolution. Uh, precisely the point. Look, if you got some evidence for animals changing to a different kind, I'd like to see it. But if you don't have any evidence, then quit teaching it as science and call it a religion. That's why for many years I've offered $10,000 for anybody with any real scientific evidence for evolution. I'd like to see it. I'll write you a check. There is none, folks. There's lots of evidence for microevolution, but that's still a variety. It's the same kind of animal. This is kept in the textbooks, I think, because that's the only way to justify abortion. They want to say it's not a human yet. Well, it's a human the instant it's conceived, and abortion is murder, plain and simple. And I'll stick by that one with anybody. Time up. Uh, Textbooks say we have appendix, which is a vestigial structure. One of the evidences for evolution is supposed to be vestigial structures. Now think about that logic. They'll say, boys and girls, you are slowly losing something. Which is not true, by the way. There are no vestigial structures. But they'll say, you're slowly losing something. Okay. See, that proves evolution. Well, hold it. That's the opposite of evolution. Is that how evolution works? You lose everything until you have it all? This textbook says the whale has a vestigial pelvis. Now, the author that writes about the whale having a vestigial pelvis is either ignorant or a liar. That's not a vestigial pelvis. Muscles have to attach to those bones because the whales cannot reproduce without those bones. They have nothing to do with walking on land. Absolutely nothing to do. That is propaganda. That's not science. This textbook tells the kids, you know, just imagine whales walking around. It's true. That's a kid's book. That's propaganda. That's a lie. This one says humans have a tailbone that is of no apparent use. I did a debate with the president of the North Alabama Atheist Association, and he said, folks, we got proof for evolution. The human tailbone, the coccyx, is vestigial. You don't need it anymore. When it was my turn, I got up and I said, Mr. Patterson, I taught biology and anatomy. I happen to know there are nine muscles that attach to the tailbone. If you think the tailbone is vestigial, I will pay to have yours removed. <laughs> Without them little muscles, there are some very, very valuable things you cannot do. <clears throat> I won't tell you what they all are, but trust me, you need them muscles. Now, <laughs> we can go on a long time, folks, but my, my point is this. Both views, creation and evolution, are inherently religious. I cannot prove God created the world, and I cannot prove there was a worldwide flood. I can show you the evidence of billions of dead things buried in rock layers. And I can show you that out west, when they killed millions of buffalo in the last 200 years, almost none of them fossilized because they weren't buried. The very existence of fossils proves to me, is evidence to me, of a worldwide flood. When they climbed Mount Everest, 1953, they found seashells by the thousands on top of Mount Everest. I think there was a flood. I don't think the water was over Mount Everest. I think Mount Everest was under the water. The mountains arose during the last part of the flood. The Bible spells all that out in Psalms chapter 104. The mountains arose, the valley sank down, and the water rushed off and probably made Grand Canyon in a few days, not millions of years. So I think the evidence is overwhelming. God made the world. There was a flood that destroyed it. And God's got a plan for you. And he loves you. And if you don't want to believe in him, that's fine. But he'd like you to. He's not going to twist your arm. But the evidence, I think, is overwhelming. And the evidence for the evolution theory is confused by mixing micro and macro. So watch for that, if you would. Thank you so much. Uh, that was dazzling, to say the least. Um... Can, can you hear now? I, I realize I have a, a, a small voice, um, although I'd like to think that I have some reasonably big thoughts. Um, but um, uh, I'm going to have to sit and, uh, because uh, in order to make a fairly complete, concise statement, uh, uh, 
uh, about evolution um, and about the problems with uh, Kent Hovind's approach uh, with his analysis of evolution. I have to, uh, have to read this. Uh, let me start by expressing some reservations I have in engaging this debate at all. Uh, I'm a professional evolutionary biologist uh, in that I have taught uh, evolution and related courses uh, here at Wayne uh, in genetics, st uh, statistics, ornithology, and a number of other courses for uh, 27 years. And over those 27 years, I've maintained an active research program uh, looking at problems in evolution concerned primarily with the evolution of species diversity uh, or speciation, which is, is the area of evolutionary biology that is right at the interface uh, uh, between... Can't hear. Can't hear. I just said I had to hold it real close. It's on. Just... Uh, I can try. Is that better? Okay, I'm trying to hold me up. I was just saying that uh, my area of research uh, focuses on speciation, which is uh, at the interface between uh, what Dr. Hovind characterized as micro and macro evolution, the distinction as he characterized it between science and religion. Um, But uh, it's important to note that my approach to evolution has always been from a genetic uh, perspective. On a day-to-day -day basis, my research students and I sequence DNA as a way of getting information about relatedness among species. And we use that information to reconstruct evolutionary history. Uh, our work focuses primarily on woodpeckers, uh, not because these are a particularly interesting uh, group per se, uh, although they certainly are fascinating uh, birds, uh, but because they provide a good model uh, for studying the rapid diversification of species. I'm also very interested in a thing uh, called the molecular clock, which is a novel way of timing evolutionary events in uh, establishing the antiquity of, uh, of species. Uh, Dr. Hovind, in contrast, is a science educator with an interest in paleontology, which is to say the fossil record. So I'm a little bit concerned first that we're going to simply talk past one another to a considerable extent. Uh, unavoidably, the discussion is going to come to focus uh, to, to some extent on the fossil record, and particularly uh, esoteric details of radiometric dating. Uh, that is dating geological structures based on radioactive decay. And in this sense, you would have done much better to have gotten someone from the geology or physics department uh, than, uh, than me. Uh, moreover, Kent is a young earth creationist, which means that he believes the earth is about uh, 6,000 years old, as he indicated. And it, so it seems to me that the debate boils down to his defense of that notion. Uh, this, in turn, means that we may hardly talk about some of the most interesting ideas in evolutionary theory, uh, the philosophies and histories of science and religion, uh, and the interface between the two. I'm also concerned because this is the first debate of this sort that I've uh, engaged in, whereas Kent uh, is a professional creatist, a creationist debater. Uh, he actually makes his living doing this, which is, which, which is amazing. Yes, <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Amen. Uh, <laughs> I had the uh, disconcerting experience last spring after agreeing to participate in this debate of receiving a number of email messages and phone calls from individuals and groups uh, who seemed to be an uh, who seemed to be professional uh, anti-creationist debaters. Uh, somehow word of this had gotten out on the internet, and some of these people seem to view these debates with much the same intensity and decorum as I remember Michigan State Notre Dame football games uh, when I was an undergraduate, or maybe Notre Dame Southern Methodist games, or Southern Methodist Brigham Young games, I'm, I'm not sure, uh, and I'm beginning to get that sense from the audience that that's what we're engaging here. Uh, it was also clear that the anti-creationists view Kent as the Hulk Hogan of creationist debaters and that I best be prepared for a real pummeling. 
At about the same time, uh, I spoke with Kent on the phone. He briefly told me about his belief system that he was a young earth creationist. Uh, he was very cordial, expressing none of the threatening mannerisms of a professional wrestler. Uh, but I was startled at one point in the conversation when he announced that he was going to convert me. So here I am, a novice debater about to get in the ring with an intellectual Hulk Hogan and if I lose, I must submit to his belief system. Perhaps this is the true meaning of midlife crisis. <laughs> well, let me, let me begin to disappoint uh, right away by saying that I don't view this as a debate, but rather as an opportunity to explore some interesting ideas, some interesting cultural conflicts, and certainly Kent pointed to those and some interesting philosophical conflicts. I also view this as an opportunity to fulfill in a very small way an obligation I feel I have to Wayne State students. I've taught at Wayne many, many years. Uh, I know that most of our students, most of my students, live at home and often live in two cultures. On the one hand, they attend a large, modern, very culturally diverse, secular university where science is taught hard, fast, and technical with little class time devoted to reflection on the meaning of science and the conflict uh, that a scientific worldview uh, might have with traditional ideas. It's certainly not my intention to change uh, anyone's worldview per se. I'm not going to convert you. But on the other hand, but on the other hand, um, we have failed as university educators uh, if you do not emerge from, uh, from university with a different perspective. I mean, how can one learn about probability theory, the genetic basis of life, the intricate molecular mechanisms of cells, uh, development in the sense of embryology, and yes, uh, evolution, and not have a changed view? And so I view this debate as an opportunity to explore some of these conflicts. And as pummeled as I may be at the end of the debate, I'll be happy uh, if I believe some of you have left with some understanding of the nature of the differences between the scientific method uh, as philosophical system uh, and theologically based philosophical systems. Actually, the college professor wells up in me uh, and uh, is telling me that I should probably give you a pop quiz at the end of the class. And I must say that Kent's introduction uh, certainly fans those flames uh, because he portrayed a very incorrect uh, uh, statement about what science is. What I see as the foundation, the key to understanding this conflict, lies at the various deepest levels in the philosophies of science and religion, that is, in the metaphysics of the contrasting philosophical systems. So what I'm going to say for the next few minutes is going to sound like philosophy of science 101, uh, although unfortunately our students rarely take uh, such a course. I also point out that I use the word metaphysics not in the sense of uh, listening to New Age music, burning incense, and eating vegetarian pizza, but rather as that area of philosophy that deals with first principles, with those things that cannot be deduced or proven to be true. We simply take them to be true by assumption or supposition. We might say, for example, let's suppose that the geological forces of erosion, volcanism, glaciation, et cetera, et cetera, that we see operating today have always worked in the same way. What could we learn from this? What would this lead uh, to uh, as a set of inferences about the Earth's history uh, that uh, may seem sensible? We can't really defend these assumptions, and Kent has pointed this out, uh, we can't prove it to be true. We can't simply make it a part of our, uh, we can simply make it a part of our philosophical system and see how successful that system is in leading us to new discoveries. This is essentially what geologists did in the late 18th and 19th century, uh, and this led to the very first inkling that the Earth must be a pretty old place. 
At the base of science, I think, is a very small and clear set of first principles, the metaphysics of science. And that leads to the so-called scientific method. If I could have the, the first overhead. Um, this is one scientist's um, statement as to what uh, scientific method is. He says, uh, in general, we look for a new law by following process, by, follow, by the following process. First, we guess. Don't laugh. It's really true. Then we compute the consequences of the guess to see if this law that we guessed is right, what it should imply. Then we compare those computation, computation results with nature, we say, to experiment or experience. We compare it directly with observation to see if it works. If it disagrees with experiment, it's wrong. And that simple statement is the key to science. It doesn't make any difference how smart you are, who made the guess, or what his or her name is. If it disagrees with experiment, it's wrong. That's all there is to it. This short, whimsical, um, even facetious statement is actually a fairly concise and complete statement of the scientific method, as simple as it is. One of the most interesting phrases in uh, Fenman's description is, quote, first we guess. A very confusing issue uh, we must deal with straight away is that of what it means to say evolution by natural selection is a theory as opposed to a hypothesis or fact or even a guess. Nowadays, scientists pretty much use the words theory and hypothesis interchangeably, and even the words conjecture and yes, the word guess is synonyms for theory and a hypothesis. Uh, Steve Gould made this very important point in his talk last week when he pointed out that there is no hierarchy where guesses are promoted to hypotheses and hypotheses elevated to uh, theories and theories uh, elevated to natural laws. They're all really guesses which uh, have been tested against empirical evidence uh, or not tested. Uh, and if they've been tested, they've been falsified or not falsified. But it is equally true that a guess, hypothesis, or theory that has been tested and not falsified has to some extent been corroborated. That is found to be useful in explaining some sets of observations and pointing to new experiments that we might do. In that sense, some theories are better than others, and in that sense, if someone were to ask me if evolution by natural selection were a fact, which often happens, uh, I would say, of course not. Uh, but it is not merely a theory. It is one that has withstood test after test after test without being falsified. I repeat, without being falsified falsified. It is in the secular pantheon uh, of scientific theories, that is natural selection theory, along with quantum mechanics, relativity, atomic theory, continental drift, and a few others. But none of these theories are facts. Here are what I think are roughly the first principles of science, if we could have the, the next overhead. Uh, the first one, uh, Kent referred to somewhat derisively, uh, that natural law acts the same way at all times and in all places. This is a first principle of science. It's not something that we can prove. Uh, this is the idea that I alluded, alluded to above that seems to uh, have been derived uh, from the ideas among geologists of the 19th century, and it's the idea that they called uniformitarianism. Implicit in this is that science doesn't deal with miracles because miracles by definition involve circumstances where natural law is set aside. Now conceivably science could determine whether a miracle had taken place, but I even doubt that. 
For example, someone might make the claim that so-and-so had arisen from the dead, and we might apply a scientific analysis to determine that the person in question was, in fact, once dead and was now, in fact, alive. But even here, we would want to be very wary of a possible hoax, substituting, for example, a live identical twin for the dead person. So even here, I would want to see maybe three replicates with proper controls. And this is what religion, which does deal with miracles, cannot provide for us. Second principle. Hope that's in focus. Scientific observations are repeatable. This uh, arguably is more a corollary of the uniformitarianism principle than a distinct first principle because it follows that if natural law, law acts the same way at all times and in all places, uh, that I or anyone else can repeat the experiment. When I submit a paper to a scientific journal for publication, it always has a materials and methods section that describes exactly what I did to get that particular result. If it doesn't have a materials and methods section, it would be immediately rejected. In contrast, one never sees a materials and methods section in a religious tract. It just doesn't work that way. Third principle. Scientific theories must be testable, and to be more explicit, they must be falsifiable. And this is the heart of the scientific method. I alluded to this a few moments ago, and this is perhaps the central tenet of the scientific method, Popper's so-called line of demarcation between, between science and non-science, between science and religion. Implicit in this is that a scientific theory must be tested, or excuse me, must be stated, in addition to being tested, it must be stated with sufficient clarity precision, detail, and internal consistency that one can, one can deduce singular, unequivocal predictions from the theory that are testable against the empirical evidence. The book of Genesis suffers badly in this regard. Uh, fourth principle. There is a web of interconnectedness and internal consistency. Theories in all branches of science must be consistent with all the theories and empirical evidence in all other sciences. Thus, the theory of evolution by natural selection must be consistent with genetics and cell biology, but also with geology and physical chemistry and so on. If this isn't true, there's something wrong with one of the theories or some of the data. It's so a really interesting example of this involves the history of Darwin's theory itself, uh, which, although somewhat initially successful, that is Darwin's theory, uh, the publication of the joint Darwin-Wallace papers in 1858 and the publication of The Origin Species in 1859, um, Darwin was essentially dead by the year 1900, uh, so proclaimed by Alfred uh, Wallace himself. Uh, why was it dead? Uh, because it was inconsistent with a widely accepted theory of the age of the earth and an incorrect theory of inheritance based on the notion of blending inheritance. Uh, the theory of the earth's age was promulgated by Lord Calvin, Calvin of the uh, temperature scale, uh, one of the most prominent physicists of his, area, uh, of his era. Uh, had actually miscalculated the age of the Earth based on its rate of heat loss, uh, giving Darwin only 24 million years for evolution, which even Darwin uh, thought inadequate. It turned out that the physicists based their calculations on an incorrect theory, and that Darwin was right when he wrote in a letter late in his life uh, that he somehow sensed the age of the Earth was greater than Calvin had allowed. Calvin made his calculations uh, before, very shortly before actually, the discovery of radioactivity and the vast store of energy in the nuclei of atoms uh, had not been taken into account in his calculations. The problem of blending inheritance, which uh, Kent alluded to also, 
uh, is uh, that <clears throat> is uh, the problem, not the blending inheritance itself, is that selection operates on genetic variation, and, and it certainly does. But a sexual reproduction uh, blends away variation, as Kent suggested. Uh, there would be nothing for selection to operate on, and this indeed would be a problem because uh, Darwin's theory requires uh, that genetic variation uh, exist in populations and it uh, comes into existence in population. Uh, but this was a false falsification, as it were, of Darwin's theory uh, towards the latter part of the 19th century. And uh, Mendel's theory, which was rediscovered in the year 1900, uh, uh, provided a sound uh, genetic uh, uh, foundation upon which a theory of natural selection could operate and actually led to the rebirth of Darwinism, uh, which is being so intensely uh, battled uh, by creationists today. Uh, final point is that scientists are reductionists. Uh, that is, all natural phenomena uh, can be explained in simpler terms. And I would say that scientists are incorrigible reductionists. Uh, this may not exactly be a first principle of science, uh, but it's certainly part of the sociology of science, the culture of science. Uh, biologists have insisted for a long time that the whole of life, uh, meaning essentially the activities of cells, could be understood in terms of chemistry. Uh, and this has been dramatically confirmed in the past half century or, or, or so, uh, and particularly in the past two decades with the extraordinary progress uh, that has been made in cell biology, uh, which is now pretty much called uh, molecular cell biology. So life, uh, as we understand it, is uh, reducible. I, I now uh, want to just take a few minutes to briefly walk through the major classes of evidence, uh, much as Kent did, that bear on the origins of species, uh, the diversity of life uh, in all of its complexity uh, and all of its uh, seeming adaptedness. Um, on the one hand, and, and I want to look at uh, neo-Darwinism, the theory of evolution, uh, in contrast to uh, creationist theory in contact, context of, um, uh, of these metaphysical principles. On the one hand, we have neo-Darwinism that claims that the whole uh, of the diversity of life uh, evolved from a single or from a few initial forms, primarily by a process of natural selection uh, operating on genetic variation uh, as characterized by the principles of modern genetics. On the other hand, we have the particular theory of creationism advocated by Kent Hovind, and it's not the only uh, theory of creationism. It is perhaps the most extreme position. It's based on literal, literal interpretation of the Bible, and especially the book of Genesis. And what I want to do is to look on a rather coarsely focused level at how these different classes of data bear on the alternative theories in context of uh, the metaphysics of science. And I point out before I do this that if you are not doing your analysis in context of the metaphysics, the first principles that I uh, set forth, and, and these are not my principles, I simply read a bit in the philosophy of science and um, extract these from what I think is the current thinking about uh, the philosophy of science. If you do not do your analysis in this context, you're not doing science, you're doing something else. This is where the line of demarcation is uh, between science and religion. It's not between microevolution and macroevolution. Let me say first uh, that it's difficult to derive 
predictions from the Genesis hypothesis. Genesis is an historical account and not an explanation of mechanism, at least in the sense of natural law. And it provides mechanism in the sense that God intervenes and does what he pleases at times he chooses, but that violates the uniformitarianism principle of science, and so that's not science. Moreover, Genesis is very ambiguous. It is a very sparse account of what are purported to be two of the most profound events in history, the creation and the great flood. Even setting aside the arguments over the meanings of specific words translated from ancient Hebrew texts, it leaves broad latitude for interpretation. This makes the Genesis hypothesis difficult to test. And so a priori, we seem to be on the margin of science. In contrast, neo-Darwinism is very precisely formulated, even in a body of mathematical formulations called population genetics. There are specific things natural selection can and cannot do, and specific changes in genes and gene frequencies that can and cannot happen. Uh, this is what uh, Feynman referred to as making the computations based on the guess. It's very difficult to make the computations based on Genesis because it is so vague. It's very easy to make them uh, based on neo-Darwinism. But even though I think it's very difficult to test the Genesis hypothesis because of its ambiguity, let's do the best we can. The fossil record. The fossil evidence is not the most important evidence in evaluating evolution theory. Nonetheless, it does exist, and neo-Darwinism makes specific predictions about patterns in the fossil record. Uh, for example, there should be a stratigraphy, what Kent referred to as the stratigraphic column, an ordering of older, more primitive forms at the bottom and more recently more derived forms at the top. The Genesis hypothesis is not explicit about the fossil record, but as I understand Kent's interpretation, there is a single massive bout of extinction resulting from the Noachian flood. Accordingly, there should be no particular strategic uh, there should be a single stratum, or if there are multiple strata where organisms were sorted according uh, to weight, uh, habitat, or intelligence, uh, the strata should all be of the same age, namely roughly 4,400 years. The fossil record is, to my knowledge, wholly consistent with neo-Darwinism in terms of classic stratigraphy and also in terms of modern radiometric dating and also, although <clears throat> these data and this type of analysis is uh, uh, very much in process right now, uh, the stratigraphic column is also consistent with dates based on the molecular clock. There was an article to that effect in a recent issue of Nature. In contrast, the stratigraphy itself and the radiometric dates of fossil bearing strata stretching back more than three billion years are completely inconsistent with the Genesis hypothesis. And in the metaphysical system of science, the Genesis hypothesis simply is falsified if, in fact, the Earth and the fossil bearing strata are older than 6,000 years. Biogeography. One of my favorite topics. The theory of evolution predicts that there should be strong correspondence between phylogenies, that is, the evolutionary histories of species, and geological events. For example, there should be relationships at deep levels in phylogenies of animals in South America with animals in Africa because the two continents formed a single supercontinent some 80 plus million years ago, according to modern geological theory, uh, specifically continental drift. And there should be a more recent set of relationships with animals of North America, that is between North America and South America, 
because South America contacted North America through the Isthmus of Panama just 3.5 million years ago. Uh, and uh, according to evolution theory, there was an interchange of numerous species and the evolution of species in South America from ancestors emanating from North America and vice versa. Uh, if you've ever seen a possum, and I'm sure most of you have that live in the metropolitan Detroit area, that is one North American species whose ancestors live in South America. And this biogeographic pattern, which corresponds very, very tightly with geological history, is exactly the pattern observed. It is exactly the pattern that neo-Darwinism would predict, and it is essentially confirmed. The Genesis theory, in contrast, says little or nothing about biogeographic pattern at this scale, and so it doesn't serve us very well as a scientific hypothesis or theory. Phylogenetic reconstruction. Based on the supposition that evolution has occurred, evolutionary biologists have devised rather simple methods for reconstructing evolutionary history or phylogenies. And I certainly admit immediately this assumes that evolution has occurred, and if it hasn't, we couldn't do this. A phylogeny is a branching diagram, a family tree that shows who is related to whom and the order in which species evolve. According to the theory of evolution, the branching order of phylogeny should correspond with the stratigraphic order of the fossil record and with the history of geological events. The data from the fossil record is, of course, incomplete, and for technical reasons, we are not able to reconstruct accurate phylogenies for all groups. Science always has a lot of holes. But the overall pattern very strongly corroborates this prediction. In contrast, the Genesis hypothesis says that all species ro ro arose, originated, <coughs> within a short period of time uh, as <coughs> disconnected acts of special creation. If this were the case, we wouldn't be able to reconstruct phylogenies at all. This is clearly not the case. Homology. The concept of homology is one of the most important in evolutionary biology. It is based on the idea clearly articulated by Darwin that according to the theory of evolution, all structures, anatomical, genetical, even functions and behaviors must have evolved from previously existing structures in a common ancestor. These species should share, should that's a tough one to get out. These species should share similar structures because they all inherited, uh, all inherited them from mod uh, inherited them, modified by evolution from a common ancestral structure. Such structures are said to be homologous. This pattern of homology is predicted by Darwin, pervades the full spectrum of life. Classically, it is known from comparative anatomy and embryology. For example, as radically different as the avian wing is from the vertebrate forelimb, as Kent's illustration showed, uh, the major bones are homologous, and each can be traced to the same embryonic origin and to homologous bones in fossil forms. When molecular genetics arrived some 20 or so years ago, it provided uh, one of the most critical an exhaustive test of the theory of evolution. Specifically, we ought to find pervasive homology among genes, bearing in mind that Darwin's prediction is that no structure can arise de novo. Every structure must arrive from a previously existing structure. So we should anticipate finding this similarity, this homology among genes, and this is exactly the pattern we find. To be honest with you, we didn't think uh, at the advent of molecular genetics, or we didn't think of that advent as the grand test of evolution. I think we all just knew that the expected patterns of homology would be there, and they were. If anything, 
if this is possible. They are even clearer than anyone imagined. The extent of homology among genes controlling animal development, that is your passage from an egg through an embryo to an adult, uh, and that of a mouse from its larval or, or egg stage through its embryonic stages to an adult, and that of a fruit fly, the homology among the genes that control those processes uh, is really quite astonishing. The genes are not identical by any means. Uh, evolution theory would predict that they were different, but they would also predict that we ought to find the pattern of relatedness in the form of a phylogeny. In fact, genes themselves have evolutionary history so that we now reconstruct not only the history of relatedness among species, but also among genes within what are called gene families. The Globin gene family, each and every one of us has a large array of genes that code for our globins, which are important proteins in, in, in blood and in oxygen uh, transport. The Globin gene family is perhaps the best known example, but it is only one of a myriad of examples. And in fact, it is difficult to find a gene that doesn't belong to a gene family. If Kent wants to convert me from an evolutionist, all he need to do is to show me a consistent pattern where genes within the genome appear to have arisen de novo, that is, are not related to other genes, or where genes compared among species uh, are not similarly related. Kent was kind enough to send me a videotape of one of his previous debates. Um, frankly, it wasn't nearly as slick as the presentation that he gave today, and I'm, I, I'm kind of wondering if I haven't been set up here. Uh, but in viewing the tape, it's easy to see why he's a formidable advocate of the creationist position. He is articulate, he knows his position well, and he is really quick on his feet. He is especially quick at rattling off facts that call into question almost all of the evidence normally put forth by evolutionists. However, I put the word fact in quotes because at least some, and I suspect most of these factoids, are not facts at all, but rather misconstructions uh, and misunderstandings of the scientific literature, and in at least some cases, apparent fabrications. A problem I have, and I think all scientists have in dealing with this aspect of creationist debates, uh, is that I read a very small fraction of the huge volume of, of literature published in biology, even in my own area. And so when I heard Kent say uh, in uh, the debate video he sent me with great assurance that a paper was published in the January 1970 issue of Science reporting that a moon rock was divided into nine pieces sent to nine laboratories for radiometric dating and returned with nine disparate dates ranging from 0.5 to 18 billion years, I faulted myself for being unaware of that important result because it seemingly would call into question uh, radiometric dating. However, when we investigated the report, and I want to acknowledge uh, the uh, considerable help of a small group of very competent students who helped me pursue some of these reports this summer, when we pursued this report, we found that it is not actually, or, or not exactly, not exactly, and I want to choose my words uh, carefully, the correct reconstruction of the report. The report is actually a set of nine reports published in tandem in a special issue devoted to the first reports of the moon rock analyses in 1970. Each report emanates from a distinct lab, and so uh, this part of Kent's account is correct. Uh, however, we could find, uh, we could not find a single rock that had gone to all nine laboratories. Uh, the closest was a rock, specimen number 10017, which was partitioned among six laboratories and in some was dated 13 times. The dates on this specimen uh, reported in uh, this particular issue uh, do range from 2.5 to 4.6 billion years, 
but the 2.5 billion year date is an outlier resulting from a well-known uh, phenomenon in potassium argon dating uh, resulting from cataclysm. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I have one minute remaining, I'm told. Uh, let me jump to the bottom line of that. Uh, the real range of dates on the specimen goes from 3.56 to 4.38 billion years, and the uh, bogus dates uh, are attributable to a well-known phenomenon of argon loss. Let me, re uh, <clears throat> with the few seconds I have left, um, mention the example that really raised uh, red flags, and, and indeed I took a certain amount of umbrage at this. And uh, I quote uh, Kent from this uh, debate where he says, and I quote, two to three years ago uh, when they found the dinosaur bones in Antarctica, they were not even fossilized. They were fresh, preserved, frozen dinosaur bones still containing carbon. They didn't carbon date them because it would have come back with a date less than 50,000 years. Uh, this uh, raised alarm flags in me because it is so close to my area that I felt that I would have known about this if it were a fact. Uh, I did a quick literature search uh, using the wonderful computerized uh, uh, literature search systems we had, could find no such reference. Uh, I called uh, a paleontologist, Bill Hammer, who uh, discovered the only dinosaur bones to be discovered in the Antarctic. Uh, I read the quote to him. He said, "Is simply he knew of no such specimens." Uh, Hammer's 1991 specimen uh, remains the only dinosaur bone uh, from Antarctic uh, uh, proper, uh, and it was completely mineralized. So I simply caution you. These facts that come out, don't take them at face value. For that matter, don't take what I say at face value. Open up your minds. Go to the library. If something sounds odd, investigate it yourself. And with that, I'll cease and desist for the moment. Thank you so much, Dr. Moore. Uh, I've got quite a list of things. We won't get through it in time, I don't believe. I'll hurry here. Um, he said the presentation was dazzling. I appreciate that. Uh, this is all, by the way, not taxpayer funded. Uh, he said, I take a most extreme position, believing the Bible is literally true. I plead guilty as charged. Uh, you said the presentation was slick. Um, that, at least by most people, I think would be taken as kind of a backhanded slap. Uh, quick rattling off of facts that are misconstrued. I would interpret that to be a lie. I would be glad to defend you know, anything I've said. Take one topic at a time. Um, professional debater. Make my living at it. I paid $900 to get a ticket to come up here. Uh, I was in northern Michigan earlier this week. Flew all the way home. Spoke six times yesterday. Came up here just for this debate. I'm not going to make a penny off of this. I don't make money off of this. Uh, that it bothered me a little bit knowing that you for 30 years have gotten your salary from the taxpayers of this area to teach evolution theory and I don't take a dime of taxpayer money that just that seems to me something's wrong with all this <clears throat> I'm not a professional debater I was just simply a high school science teacher who got fed up with kids being brainwashed with one particular theory as far as the Hulk Hogan well you can see the resemblance is striking <laughs> I would think after 30 years of teaching this very topic, you would be the Hulk Hogan of the evolutionists. I mean, uh, and you mentioned you might lose because you're outmatched. Well, for heaven's sake, this is what you teach all, you know, all day, every day, and get paid for. Um, none of my material is copyrighted. It never has been. I never have charged a dime for any of my seminars, and I've never sent out a letter begging for money. That's been my policy since I started. Um, and you mentioned, I don't know if it didn't get the quote down quick enough, but uh, the university would have failed if they did not emerge having an understanding of, and you rattled off several things, and one of which was embryology. I trust you're not referring to what was disproven in 1874 uh, about the ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny. You referred to it again later as uh, the homology of genes for embryology is evidence for evolution. I would really like to see you elaborate on that because I think the homology of genes is evidence of a design 
uh, same design feature, same designer. Same designer made all these things. Um, <clears throat> and you mentioned about the statement, how I portrayed science was incorrect. I, again, what I guess I like to simplify things. It looks to me like you're saying I lied about the way science is uh, portrayed. Let me just uh, spell it out very clearly. Um, the scientific method, you said, and I agree, you start off with a guess. Then you compute the consequences. You know, what would this imply? Then you would do some experiments, and the experiments must be repeatable. I agree. And if the experiments do not verify the guess, you throw out the guess. You get a new one. Let me tell you my scientific theory. I believe the evidence will show, after intensive uh, investigation, that no amount of scientific evidence will ever show that matter can create itself. Therefore, there must be an outside source that created the matter. Now, that goes beyond science, goes into a religion, and the creationist says, yep, we agree, we have a religion, we believe God did it. Can't prove it, that's what we believe. What happens is, though, the evolutionist does not admit they have a religion in this area. Where is the scientific evidence to show where matter originated? Where is the scientific evidence? Where is it repeatable? You said you'd like to see things repeated three times. I'd like to see three experiments where somebody makes something from nothing. I would like to see the experiment where life learned or came from non-living material. This has never been observed. This is part of a religion. Evolution is the religion. They have to believe life came from non-living material. We've had numerous experiments with raising, pick any kind of animal or plant you'd like. All of the experimentation has taught us dogs produce dogs. Roses produce roses. Now, I suspect from what you have said that you believe somewhere back in the past, dogs came from something that was non-dog. You're welcome to believe that. What experiments do you have for that? What scientific evidence do you have to show us that a dog came from a non-dog or that a dog can produce a non-dog or pick any other animal if you'd like? If your expertise is woodpeckers, I'd really be curious on that one since the woodpecker has the tongue that goes around his head and anchors on top of his eyebrow. What intermediate species do you have showing the tongue changing from normal bird tongue to the top of the head tongue? And where's the fossil evidence of anything besides a woodpecker? Anything intermediate? I mean, just, just within the bird kind. I mean, where's the evidence? If that's your expertise, I'd love to see some evidence on that. Um, experimentation for the origin of life, I think, the evolutionists simply believe. Matter either created itself or is eternal. Those go strictly against uh, the first and second laws of thermodynamics. That's not science, that's religion. The evolutionist must believe life came from non-living material. He's boxed himself into a corner, folks. That's the only option. If you're going to exclude God, then you have to give a naturalistic explanation for how life got started. I've never heard him do that. Miller and Urey tried it years ago. There have been numerous experiments to try to create life. Total failures. What Miller was able to make after a very carefully contrived fictitious experiment where he made, made a fictitious atmosphere of four gases and left out oxygen purposely. We can go for days on that if you'd like. He left out oxygen because he knew oxygen would destroy the life. Problem is, without oxygen, you don't have ozone, and then the UV light destroys the life. You can't get life to evolve with oxygen, and you can't get life to evolve without oxygen. Looks to me like you can't get life to evolve. What he was able to make after this experiment was done, and by the way, he trapped out his residue each time so it wouldn't go back through because it would be destroyed again. It's not a natural explanation at all. He was able to make 85% tar, 13% carboxylic acid, and 2% amino acids. The amino acids will bond quickly with the tar or the carboxylic acid and destroy them. All he made was basically two amino acids, a few of others, but basically two. There are 20 required for life. And they all have to be in a precise order and all right-handed or left-handed, depending if it's a sugar or DNA molecule. And all he made was all a mixture. He got half right-handed, half left-handed. The chirality was all mixed up. It's never going to form in life. And we can go for days on that if you'd like, but I just want to kind of hit the highlights here. I would say the experimentation has shown us, the scientific evidence has shown us Dogs always produce dogs. Roses always produce roses. Therefore, the evidence shows us there had to be a beginning to this someplace, and it must have been the same kind of animal because we've never seen an animal produce a different kind. So that goes right back to what the Bible says. God created the animals, and they bring forth after their kind. Now, I can't prove that, but all the evidence has shown us that that is indeed correct. I think the Genesis account is not nebulous on this. It tells us very clearly God made the animals to bring forth after their kind. If you have an exception to that, I would love to see it. If you find a fossil in the ground that someone claims is intermediate, oh, I meant to turn that thing on. First place, when you find a fossil in the ground, you know a couple things for sure. 
it died. Now, you do not know if it had any kids, let alone different kids. All you know is it died. It's buried. The very existence of fossils to me is a powerful evidence of a worldwide flood because, again, fossils don't form under normal conditions. They have to be buried quickly. Uh, let me get a few more things before I uh, get into where I was leaving off here. Science and non-science. Uh, you must state a theory with detail. I agree. Evolution, macroevolution, is not science. It's non-science and nonsense. We've never seen this happen. Nobody's ever seen an animal produce a different kind of animal. But like I said, beer is sold at football games, and macroevolution is included in with science, and I'm sorry about that. I'm working on it pretty hard. I'm trying to get it out of there. Um, selection operates on variations only. Uh, I agree, but like I said, the variations have limits. And the selection process is not going to change it to a new kind of animal any more than GM's you know, quality control will change the truck to a helicopter. It'll just make a stronger truck. That's all it can do. Um, Neo-Darwinism, I, I, I suspect you're referring to Stephen Gould or Niles Eldridge or uh, re, re uh, building of uh, Goldschmidt's theory, punctuated equilibrium. The, the, if that's what you believe, then we'll talk about that in a second. But the textbooks show these family trees as if we all came from a bacteria. Even Mary Leakey, an evolutionist, said, all those trees of life with their branches of our ancestors is a lot of nonsense. Stephen Gould, the evolutionary trees that adorn the textbook, our textbooks have data only at the tips and nodes of their branches. The rest is inference. However reasonable, not the evidence of fossils. Stephen Gould says there's no evidence, <clears throat> but they show these in the textbooks as if they all came. The humans, the birds, and the crocodiles had a common ancestor. That's propaganda. That's not science. All we know is humans have produced humans, birds have produced birds, crocodiles have produced crocodiles. Now, if you want to believe they got a common ancestor, fine, but I resent letting my tax dollars go to have that be taught to the kids in our school system. Amen. Glenn Cobiology says, all the many forms of life on earth today are descended from a common ancestor. I don't believe that for a second. All I've ever seen is dogs produce dogs. That's all anybody's ever seen. So what the evolutionist appeals to is time. Well, maybe it happened, you know, billions of years ago, slowly. So in other words, because we don't see it happening, that proves it happened in the past. Well, try that in a court of law, see how far you get. The DNA structure, we'd love to talk about that. The human DNA is unbelievably complex. This DNA code you have, just the code from one person, if it's the DNA chromosomes in your body would stretch from Earth to the moon and back five million times, coming out of two tablespoons. Unbelievably complex DNA code that we have. And we could talk about that all day if you like. Textbooks often show the kids that the horse evolved from a four-toed horse. This is one of their evidences. It's in almost every biology textbook. What they don't tell the kids, and I think they should, is that the original so-called horse, the Eohippus, has 18 pairs of ribs. The Mesohippus has 15 pairs of ribs. Merohippus has 19. Modern horse has back to 18. They also don't tell them that the experts on horse evolution are saying this horse evolution has not held up to scrutiny. Here's the problems with it. Othniel Marsh made this up in 1874. He picked animals from all over the world. He arranged them in the order he thought it happened. He did not find them in that order. Modern horses are found in layers with and lower than the ancient horses. The ancient horse is not a horse at all. It's a hyrax still alive today in South, today in South America. It's the size of a fox. It's a meat-eating animal. There's no relation. The ribs are different. The toes are different. The teeth are different. It's just pure propaganda to arrange them in some fictitious order. That is not the way they're found at all. Tulsa Zoo finally took out their horse evolution display because so many people complained about it being uh, inaccurate. I think that's fair. Yale University still has theirs, and I suspect your textbooks here still have theirs because, after all, what would we replace it with? Arranging things in order doesn't prove a thing, folks. If I get buried on top of a hamster, that doesn't prove he's my grandpa. The order of burial proves nothing. And I think the fossil evidence is indicating that there was a worldwide flood and it shuffled these things around for several months during this flood. And animals are, by the way, if I handed a geologist at your university a piece of limestone and said, would you please tell me if this is Cambrian limestone, Jurassic limestone, Permian limestone, I mean, limestone's found in all the different eras. How do you know the age of the limestone? There is only one way they can tell the age of that limestone, by the index fossils. The fossils determine the age of the rock layer it comes from. But the rock layer determines the age of the fossils that are in it. Circular reasoning, folks, that's what it's based on. We can talk for several days on that if you'd like. 
I've arranged stuff in order for years. I proved knives evolved to forks very slowly over millions of years. I even found the missing link. Right between forks and spoons, there's the missing link right there. <laughs> Just arranging something in order doesn't prove anything, folks. I can't believe textbooks are now telling the kids that birds are the descendants of dinosaurs. How absurd can you get? You don't just stick a few feathers on them and say, come on, man, let's go, you can do it. It's not quite that simple, folks. Um, the birds have feathers, obviously. Reptiles have scales. This textbook says bird feathers evolve from the same scales that protected the dinosaurs so well. Nobody's ever seen that happen. First place, feathers and scales come from different genes on the chromosome. Secondly, they're both made out of keratin, and that's where the similarity stops. They attach to the gene, they attach to the skin or to the body differently. Feathers are an extremely complex structure. Extremely complex. Now, if you want to believe that came from a frayed scale from an animal trying to chase insects and catch them with his flap, flappers, you know, feathers on his wings, you're welcome to believe that, but that's not science. That's, again, part of somebody's religion. Problems with the bird evolution. The lungs are totally different between birds and reptiles. One have a sac type lung, reptiles do, birds have a tubular type lung. Modern birds are found in layers with and lower than the dinosaurs. Scales and feathers attach to the body differently and develop from different genes on the chromosomes. They have, birds have a four-chambered heart. Reptiles have a three-chambered heart. The layer, reptiles lay leathery eggs. There are literally thousands of differences. I, I, I don't care if somebody wants to believe dinosaurs turn to birds. They can believe that if they want. But don't use my money to put it in our schools to teach it to my kids. Now, if these folks want to go start a private school and teach evolution, whoever wants to pay and come learn it, that's fine. But they know that endeavor would fall flat on its face in a hurry. So the only way you can push this evolution religion is to get all the taxpayers to pay for it in a university like this. That's not fair. Uh, Swinson, British Museum of Natural History, largest fossil collection in the world, said the evolutionary origin of birds is largely a matter of deduction. There is no fossil evidence of the stages through which the remarkable change from reptile to bird was achieved. But the textbook says, boys and girls, Archaeopteryx is evidence. This is the one they always use, Archaeopteryx. They say it has claws on its wings, which is true. So do nine other, or 11 other birds, the ostrich, the hoats, and the taraco, the ibis. Several birds have claws on their wings. And the example here that the, this proves he used to be a dinosaur is again saying, look, he lost his claws. OK. That doesn't prove how he got them. That's an example of losing. Same thing with the teeth in the beak. Not many birds have teeth. Ostrich and, or, I mean, uh, uh, Archaeopteryx and Hesperornis, the only ones I'm aware of. But some fish have teeth, some don't. Some reptiles have teeth, some don't. Some of you have teeth, some don't. <laughs> Again, that doesn't prove anything. And that's another example of losing, not gaining. That's not an example that's going to help the evolution theory. Textbook says the coccyx, the tailbone, has no present function. Now, this author is either extremely ignorant of anatomy, or he's a liar desperately trying to find evidence to support his religion. I would be nice and call him stupid. I hope he's not lying deliberately, but he certainly is stupid about anatomy. The tailbone is not a vestigial structure. It'd be nice to have a tail, wouldn't it? Be able to come to the door with two sacks of groceries. Charles Darwin said, if my theory be true, numberless intermediate varieties must assuredly have existed. Page 211, right here. Well, Charlie, what have we found? Largest fossil collection in the world, British Museum of Natural History, Colin Patterson, responded to the question, why didn't you show us any pictures of missing links in your book? Colin Patterson responded, I fully agree with, the lack, with your comments on the lack of evolutionary transitions in my book, if I knew of any, fossil or living. That's interesting. Why would you include a living creature as a missing link? He said, I would certainly have included them. I will lay it on the line. There is not one such fossil. That's why the whole chain is missing, folks. It's not a missing link we're looking for. Even Stephen Gould said, the absence of fossil evidence for intermediary stages has been a persistent and nagging problem for evolution. That's why he and Niles Eldridge have got their theory called punctuated equilibrium. Now, Goldschmidt came up with this earlier, in the 1940s, I believe, that maybe the hopeful monster theory. You know, maybe a reptile laid an egg and a bird hatched up. And Gould and Eldridge polished it up a little bit, and they said, well, maybe just evolution happened in jumps or leaps. They call it saltations. See, Darwin said, evolution happens slowly and gradually over billions of years. Gould and El not Eldridge are saying, no, it happened in leaps or jumps, saltations. What they're trying to not say is, uh, because we don't find any evidence, that proves it. See, in their mind, there's only two options. 
Evolution happened slowly, like Charlie said, or evolution happened quickly, like Stephen said. There is another option. Didn't happen at all. They don't want to consider that option for some reason. I don't know why. All fossils seem similar to living forms with no undisputed missing links discovered so far. Yes. Since we know evolution is a fact, even though there is no evidence, it happened slowly, this proves it happened quickly. That seems to be the logic, folks. I don't know how to handle that. Professor uh, at the Strasbourg Zoological Museum, can't pronounce his name, Bonauer, Bonauer, he said, evolution is a fairy tale for grown-ups. The theory has helped nothing in the progress of science. It is useless. I would like somebody to show me what advancements we have because of the evolutionary theory. It's not why we have electricity. It's not why we have plastics or rayons or fabrics, or it's not why we went to the moon. It has nothing to do with them. Uh, it's a useless theory. Malcolm Muggeridge said, I'm convinced the theory of evolution will be one of the great jokes in the history books of the future. Posterity will marvel that so flimsy, a dubious, and a hypothesis could be accepted with the incredible credulity that it has. Atomic Energy Commission. Scientists who go about teaching that evolution is a fact of life are great con men. The story they are telling may be the greatest hoax ever. In explaining evolution, we do not have one iota of fact. Charles Darwin said, to suppose that the eye could have been formed by natural selection seems absurd. But the textbook says, the complex structure of the human eye may be the product of millions of years of evolution. They tell the kids, boys and girls, you might better understand if you, how the eye might have evolved if you can picture a series of changes. See, it all takes place in the mind. Macroevolution only takes place in the imagination. We don't find any fossil evidence. We don't find any experimental evidence. It is purely a religion, and I think a silly one. But again, if somebody wants to believe that, that's fine. Just don't put it in our school system. The Bible says God formed the eye. One square inch of the back of your retina has 137 million light-sensitive cells. Now, how do you like to be the electronics engineer and have to wire that thing up in one square inch? My daddy did. He's pretty smart, ain't he? I think Satan's using that evolution theory to lead folks to hell. Folks, don't be blinded by it. God loves you. He's got a plan for your life. He made you, and uh, he's willing to forgive you. I had to repent one day and say, Lord, I'm sorry. I didn't believe you made this world. I used to believe in evolution. Lord, I'm sorry. Would you please forgive me? And now I believe in creation. I can't prove either one, but I think mine's more logical and reasonable, and I think the evidence points to it very clearly. Thank you so much. I'm beginning to uh, sense why I drifted away from Christianity uh, many years ago uh, from, from that. Uh, can't you have a <clears throat> you have a copy of the Origin of Species? I, I think can I? Uh, there are a number of uh, many many points actually that can't. Um, uh, rays that I'd like to speak to. In the origin of species, um, There's an interesting passage, um, and you can actually use it to distinguish the first edition of The Origin of Species from the other five editions. It's uh, actually the closing passage which reads that there is a grandeur in this view of life with its several powers having been originally breathed into a few forms or into one. And that while this planet has gone cycling on according to the fixed law of gravity, and then it goes uh, on and on and on. Uh, I can tell that this is a first edition, or at least that closing sentence is, uh, because in the second edition and in all subsequent editions, uh, Jar uh, Darwin uh, inserted two words such that the sentence then read, there's a grandeur in this view of life with its several powers having been originally breathed by the creator 
he inserted in the second edition. And I mention this only uh, to make the point that evolution is not a theory about the origin of life in any strict sense of the word. Uh, to Darwin and uh, in its strict sense, uh, the theory of evolution by natural selection as articulated by, as, as developed by Darwin and as articulated by evolutionary biologists like myself, is a theory of the diversification of life beyond its origin. And in this sense, and I, I mention this because I know there are a lot of uh, people of great deep faith uh, in this room, uh, that you don't want to confuse those two issues. The theory of evolution is not denying the existence of God. It doesn't say anything about the origin of the universe. It doesn't say anything about the... Uh, the origin of matter. It simply doesn't. You're, you're being misled. And it's been my experience uh, in teaching at Wayne State that a large uh, percentage of my students in evolution are actually fundamentalists of one form or another. Uh, not only Christian fundamentalists, but Jewish fundamentalists and Islamic fundamentalists as well. And we talk a great deal about this, and the overwhelming majority of them find that they are able to integrate science to include evolution into their own religious uh, experience and into their own interpretation of Genesis. And sometimes they have very, very elegant uh, interpretations of Genesis, which seem to me as sound as the very strict uh, interpretation that, that Kent gives it. So don't be confused by that issue. Um, if I could uh, just have my overhead, uh, again, the one, uh, I think it's the, the second one, the first set of the metaphysic principles, meta metaphysical principles. And it's the one that, that reads that um, <clears throat> scientific theories must be testable, and to be more explicit, they must be falsifiable. Uh, and this uh, idea, not only of testability, but falsifiability, is uh, the great advance in the philosophy of science uh, in the 20th century. Uh, the idea is usually attributed to Karl Popper, who died just a few years ago. Uh, but certainly Popper's motivation came from the dramatic changes in the physical sciences that occurred uh, when Einstein's theory of relativity uh, came to replace uh, the uh, older concepts of Newtonian mechanics because Newton's mechanics were thought to be such a complete, such a perfect theory uh, that it was inconceivable that they could be wrong. And not only that, they have been verified uh, by observation, by experimentation, uh, by gathering empirical data over and over and over again. And yet, they proved to be wrong. And hence, there was this dramatic shift in the philosophy of science, the realization that there are theories that could be wrong, that make predictions that are correct. Uh, in biology, uh, one theory we often look at in competition with uh, Darwin's theory of evolution uh, is a theory developed by uh, Jean-Baptiste Lamarck, uh, which is based on the idea of spontaneous generation of animals from, of life, from non-life, uh, and the inheritance of acquired characteristics, and then a strange sort of internal vitalistic driving force. And Lamarck's theory um, makes many, many, many predictions that are borne out. It, it has much the same prediction set uh, as Darwin's theory does. 
but it also has some problems, some shortcomings, specifically experimental evidence uh, where uh, characteristics, uh, experiments were done, particularly by uh, August Weissman in the 19th century, uh, where he cut off rats' tails and did experiments like that and demonstrated that, uh, that genes uh, or that uh, genes do not acquire characteristics derived from the environment, that is, acquired characteristics are not transmitted to the next generation. And so Lamarck's theory was falsified, even though it makes many, many predictions, it explains much. So what we need to do if we are to consider Genesis as a scientific hypothesis is to explore how it can be falsified. That is the essence of science. What sort of predictions does it make that we could test against empirical data and either corroborate the hypothesis or falsify it? And one of those predictions, at least in Kent's interpretation, is that the Earth is 6,000 years old. Now, if that were the case, uh, we would have found that to be the case uh, using radiometric dating methods. When we do that, we find that the oldest rocks on Earth are something of the order of 3.8 billion years, not 6,000 years. And even here in Michigan, uh, we have uh, bones that we can uh, carbon date that are more than 6,000 years old. And so I don't see how, within the scientific methodology, one can uh, say that creation as a theory is anything but falsified. Now, we could carry that further, um, but in order to do so, we would have to make the Genesis hypothesis more precise. And one of the terms we've got to pin down is this word, this term, kind. What is a kind? And I put that question to Kent right now. Yes, please speak <clears throat> on my time. Uh, on your time? You may, you may speak on my time. Oh, okay. Um, so that I can... I guess I would like to maybe ask you, ask you a question also to go along with your question. What is a species? A wolf and a dog are classed as a different species, yet they are interfertile. Uh, we have Canis lupus, Canis domesticus, so there's never been a good solid definition of species either. I would say the average five-year-old could tell you uh, if two animals are in the same kind. For instance, if you get a horse and a zebra, they're probably the same kind of animal. Uh, but a horse and a banana are not. So I think it would go back to the micro-macro evolution. Um, all we've ever observed is animals bringing forth after what anybody, anybody of average intelligence would consider the same kind. A Great Dane and a Chihuahua, though they're very different, are still the same kind of animal. So I'm, I'm not, I can't give you a solid definition of the word. I can tell you things that obviously are not the same kind, the horse and the banana. And I can tell you that the evolution theory does say the horse and the banana came from a common ancestor, and I can say that's not science. Um, but it seems to me that if God created kinds and revealed this in Genesis, uh, that uh, it should be known with sufficient precision that you'd be able to begin to state some of the properties. Specifically, what I'm looking for is what the genetic boundaries uh, might be. Uh, for example, um, it is problematic with domestic dogs and particularly their relationship to wolves. And um, the thinking is right now uh, that actually dogs are wolves. Uh, the genetic data uh, for a very close relationship of dogs to wolves is, is simply compelling. Uh, and uh, coyotes are not uh, much more much more distant. So would you consider those distinct species? Uh, where would you put an animal like um, a dingo in relation to those, uh, or a hyena, for example? Are they a distinct kind, or are they the same kind? And how can we delimit these boundaries so that we can begin to test 
whether there are, it's plausible that there were distinct creations of these. And, and as I said earlier, it's, it's essential that the theory be elaborated in a sufficiently precise way that we can make these tests. And uh, but before, right. uh, let me speak uh, uh, actually to this, uh, this issue of what is a species. Um, this is my area of research. And uh, to be honest with you, I don't know. Uh, now, actually, and, and this is a pervasive problem uh, or a pervasive topic of discussion, let me put it that way. It's really not a problem uh, in evolutionary biology. I just came back from uh, an international ornithological congress um, in uh, Durban, South Africa, and there was a whole session symposium devoted to species definitions, and believe me, it was very contentious. Uh, however, Darwin, in a sense, wrote the origin of species, but he also created the problem, what is a species? Because before Darwin's time, uh, before Darwin wrote the origin of species, there was no problem with what a species was. It was each individual distinct act of creation. But what Darwin said is a species arises in a continuum. And the problem is that when we see species, we see distinct entities, even though uh, wolves and dogs can interbreed. Uh, anyone, uh, <clears throat> at least anyone better, be able to tell the dis difference between a dog and a wolf. There is a profound difference between them. And there's this discontinuity. There, there are really few intermediate forms. There are no intermediate forms between bananas and, and dogs or, or whatever example uh, Kent, Kent gave. And the problem with defining species, I argue, is the same as that in defining kind. A process of evolution has occurred, and as a result, there are circumstances, there are situations that are in transition. One of the groups of birds that I work on, the flickers, the red and yellow shafted flickers of North America, are a prime example of two entities that were recognized as distinct species. They were described as such by, by uh, uh, actually, I think, by Linnaeus, uh, and certainly recognized as such by Audubon. And then suddenly, one day, uh, there was a small hybrid zone found on the Great Plains, and it was found that they interbreed. It's a case where they are in the process of speciation. And this is why evolutionary biologists have a difficult time defining species. There are these intermediate situations. But genesis, special creation, it seems to me, doesn't predict that. Why would a creator create things that were sort of capable of hybridization, that were intermediate, that weren't clearly defined? I simply don't know. Well, I would point out that probably the two types of birds that uh, are now creating a hybrid zone may have indeed come from a common ancestor. It was a bird. Uh, that would again be a, just a classic example you just gave of microevolution. That's not an example at all to help you know, the general theory of evolution. Uh, what I've seen is exactly what I predicted at the beginning. There will be lots of examples of microevolution and then people are left to make the giant faith of leap and logic into believing that that somehow proves the whole general theory of macroevolution. Uh, you gave us an example of two types of birds that are able to uh, uh, breed together. You asked, what is a kind? I don't know that I can answer the question. Uh, yeah, well, are, are all birds one kind? No, or? no. I don't know how many original kinds of birds there were. Uh, there's probably a lot of new varieties today. Uh, but can we, uh, then, regardless of how many kinds there were, uh, maybe we could figure that out if we could determine what distinguishes one kind from another in a genetic sense? Where, what is the barrier? When, when would we know yes. that we've crossed from one kind to another? I think another? that is a very valuable area of research, and that's the type of research scientists ought to be doing. That's perfectly legitimate. That has nothing to do, though, with the general theory of evolution. Uh, well, I think it has everything to do with it. And uh, in order to begin to do that sort of research, which which actually I do do, and I'd love to get some more funding, perhaps from you, uh, or, or related groups. Uh, but first, before I could write a sensible proposal, you'd have to tell me what a kind is, so I could begin to figure out 
what it is that I'm looking for that distinguishes them. There okay. has to be some aspect of your theory that leads to predictions. We have to be able to do these computations that Fenman uh, uh, alludes to, and I just don't see it in Genesis. There's no room for computation. I don't see that in evolution either. You yourself said this is your line of work, but you can't define what a species is. So I don't, I don't see how there's a problem. Well, I told you precisely why. Because process, uh, the process of evolution has occurred and there are transitional stages. I think there's another reason why. I think the creator was smart enough to give each kind of animal a gene pool that had a variety so they could survive in a number of different uh, environments. So that's part of the original design code. Well, if that were the case, why did he shortchange the cheetah, which is a large African cat, uh, which at first blush would look to be marvelously adapted. It can run at a speed of something close to 70 miles an hour, but it seems to have virtually no genetic variation in its population. Uh, right. Did God have an off day or... Uh, no, no, I think uh, the cheetah is probably swimming in the shallow end of the gene pool, as is probably the panda bear. I think the panda bear is part of the original bear kind, and it, unless drastic measures are taken, it uh, is doomed to extinction. Because of number, numbers of factors, it is probably just like a chihuahua. A chihuahua is the shallow end of the dog gene pool. Uh, if I gave you 500 chihuahuas and told you to crossbreed them to, until you get back to a Great Dane, it wouldn't happen. You can't get back to a Great Dane because so, so much genetic information is lost. The, chinita, the cheetah is probably part of an, uh, one of maybe several different original cat kinds, and the cheetah is indeed uh, genetically deficient and is, is, has serious problems. I agree. But that has nothing to do with evolution, and is nothing, it's not a slam on the creator. It's just the, gen, the gene pool has reached its limit, and the cheetah is right at the edge and probably will not survive. But that's, that's, that doesn't prove we all came from a rock, and it certainly doesn't prove the cheetah and the banana are related. It's still a cat. I'm really struggling to see the connection between those, those, those things. But I, yes, sir, I, want, I, I want to bring you back to giving me something um, about the nature of kinds that would allow me um, to distinguish at the genetic level. Okay, would you say that a goldfish and a carp are the same kind of animal. <clears throat> I don't know what a kind is. Would you say, are, the, are they the same species? Uh, is a goldfish a subspecies of the carp uh, genus? Uh, I would say that that's a marginal case, but I could explain probably fairly clearly in terms of the population genetics uh, that underlies neo-Darwinian theory of why it's a marginal case. I point out also that species is not an essential concept uh, in neo-Darwinism. It's more a concept of convenience, whereas kind is an essential concept in the Genesis hypothesis because that's what God created. Well, I think the species is the whole argument. You've got the book in your hand over there or on your table. Uh, that was Darwin's whole point, the origin of species. So what is the origin of species? Uh, it is by a process of uh, descent with modification through insensibly uh, distinct intermediate forms. It's a continuum. And as I mentioned earlier, that's the problem with defining species, because species, the, the concept of species involves the discontinuity that we observe between carp and goldfish, between red-shafted flickers and yellow-shafted flickers. And we understand that as evolutionary biologists, it's not a problem with the theory, but it seems to me that the definition of kind is at the very base of beginning to test genesis is a theory of the diversity of life. I would say the very same is true. The, the definition of species and being able to nail it down clearly and falsify it is the very base of the evolution theory. We both have the same predicament. I cannot tell you what a kind is, and I don't know that Carolus Linnaeus's classification system with kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species is the same as God's definition of kind. We today put, for instance, a whale and a dolphin in the mammal uh, family. But the Bible may consider that a fish. After all, it does live in the water. 
and I don't know that it is or it isn't, but if the Bible does consider a whale in the fish kind, that would not mean the Bible is wrong. That would mean our current way of dividing animals up is different than the Bible's way of dividing animals up. That's all. You can't say one's wrong, one's right. It's just a different way of looking at it, it's like a metric system and an Amer you know, standard system. Also, um, you know, the carp and the goldfish, I'm sure you're aware, have a different number of chromosomes. Right. The goldfish is a tetraploid, as I recall, relative <clears throat> to, the, to the carp. And the goldfish and, is... And I, I, I might add that uh, there are uh, actually a number of cases among animals and many cases uh, in plants where uh, species, and I'm going to begin to put that in quotes, um, uh, have different chromosome numbers and yet hybridize sure. to, to, to some extent. And, and again, we understand how they can do that. And, uh, oh, yeah. I, I taught biology. I understand... But the hybridization... And uh, that raises another interesting question about uh, how chromosome number relates to kind and what God had in mind in, in, in that respect. Right. I, guess, I, I suspect you're aware that chimp, uh, t humans have 46 chromosomes and tobacco has 48. Uh, mm -hmm. And amoebas have 50. And yet the evolution textbooks constantly say that we came from a single-celled amoeba-like creature and yet they've already got more chromosomes than we do. They're ahead of us, not behind us. No, that, no, whoa. <laughs> Actually, um, oh, I don't even know what species have the most chromosomes, uh, but, it's Fern. Cer but, it, but it's certainly not related to phylogenetic progression. I know of no evolutionary biologist that makes that claim. I agree. No evolutionary biologist makes that claim because the data is so against the evolutionary theory. I've got a chart. No, like no, no, it. no. Because when we reconstruct phylogenies, which show the order of evolutionary progression, and then we map chromosome numbers on them, there is not a progression. It's not because it's inconsistent with evolutionary theory. So don't you see how that the, the assumption that evolution has taken place is the underlying philosophy for how you interpret the evidence? Um, your theory drives your research instead of the research investigating or throwing out the theory. You have it backwards. Yeah, in fact, this was the, the point you were making uh, when you made the fallacious statement about the uh, freshly frozen dinosaur specimen from Antarctica. I'm glad I have the opportunity to go back to that, actually. Uh, you were <clears throat> used that in the context, uh, in a context that uh, against which I take great umbrage. Uh, and that is, uh, you were implying then and implying now uh, that when evolutionary biologists um, come across a datum or uh, are, have gotten some experimental results, uh, have the potential to gather a data like radio uh, uh, carbon dating this alleged dinosaur, fresh dinosaur from the Antarctic, that we're going to find that it's inconsistent with evolutionary theory, and therefore we're not going to date it. And that's, that's what you said in that particular statement. And my umbrage is that this implies that there's some sort of conspiracy uh, among evolutionary biologists, and I assure you <laughs> that that is not the case. No, I, I would not accuse it of you of being involved in a conspiracy. We are not trying to modify the data to fit the theory. There's nothing that I would like more than to find some fundamental flaw with the neo-Darwinian theory of evolution. I would be, become a wealthy person. I would okay. enjoy enormous success in life. I just can't find it. It's not there. Carbon dating is how it works. And my understanding of carbon dating, and then let because the, I think the average average layman does not comprehend it. And here's here's the whole explanation, and you can take notes and tell me where I'm wrong. The Earth has an atmosphere around it, roughly 200 miles thick, though effectively only 10 or 15 miles thick. But radiation from the sun and stars, stellar radiation, but mostly the sun's radiation, strikes the atmosphere and produces carbon-14. This carbon-14 is produced by the extra energy from the sunlight. Today's atmosphere is 0.0000765% radioactive carbon. Most of it is normal carbon, but a small amount is radioactive carbon. Normally, carbon is atomic number 12. Carbon-14 is simply the radioactive isotope of carbon. This Most of it is normal oxygen, typically, to become carbon dioxide, and it mixes in with the atmosphere 
with all the rest of the carbon dioxide that's out there. The wind currents and convection currents generally mix it, so we would assume whatever's being formed in the upper atmosphere is about the same proportion in the lower atmosphere. Not never proven, but a reasonable assumption, and I won't argue about that. Plants breathe in CO2 and make it part of their tissue. Animals eat the plants and make it part of their bodies. So the assumption is that whatever ratio of carbon-14 is in the upper atmosphere would be the same that's in the plants and in the animals. Probably a reasonable assumption. I won't argue with that. Radioactive carbon-14 compared to normal carbon-12 is the ratio that they're looking for. <clears throat> so they assume that the amount in the atmosphere is the same ratio found in plants and animals. When the plant or animal dies, it stops taking in new C14. Stops breathing, stops eating. Whatever it has begins to decay. And half of this carbon-14 is going to decay every 5,730 years, roughly. Some might argue about the number, but it's the concept I want you to get. Some say 5,690, but we'll, 5,630 is close enough. Half of the carbon-14 is going to decay, fall apart. So by comparing the amount of C14 in the object being dated with the amount currently in the atmosphere, it can be determined how long the object has been dead. This all sounds good, except it's based on several assumptions that throw the whole thing off. If I told you to fill a barrel with water, but I had drilled holes on the other side of the barrel, so as you reach up a certain point, it starts to leak out. You're adding it, and it's leaking out at the same time. This is a good analogy of how carbon dating works. The sun produces it, and radioactive decay takes it out. At some point, when you're filling the barrel, you're going to reach a stage called equilibrium, where you're filling it, and it's leaking at the same speed, and you will never fill the barrel. Well, Willard Libby, University of Chicago, and others have done lots of studies. He's the one who invented carbon dating, got a Nobel Prize for it in 53. Uh, the sunlight producing carbon-14 in the atmosphere and the decay taking it out should at some point reach equilibrium. So the studies re, uh, came back where the result was that probably if you took a brand new Earth, created it from scratch, stuck it out in the solar system, let this process begin, sunlight producing it, decay taking it out, it would take about 30,000 years for the atmosphere to reach equilibrium. Well, <clears throat> the atmosphere is still not in equilibrium. C14 is increasing in the atmosphere. There is more now than there was 100 years ago or 50 years ago when they first tested it. So <clears throat> that proves carbon-14 is a great proof the Earth is less than 30,000 years old because it is still not in equilibrium. Today, <clears throat> the calibration curve for carbon dating, you get about 16 clicks on your, this is a rough analogy here, about 16 clicks per minute per gram of C14. If you waited 5,730 years, you would expect to get half that amount or eight. If you wait another 5,730 years, you would get only four <clears throat> clicks per minute per gram and you would assume the object is 11,400 years old. Theoretically, it never goes to zero, but the line diminishes to where it's unmeasurable after 30 to 50,000 years. You just can't measure because the line's basically straight. So I, would under I agree, if it all works right, you would get 30 to 50,000 years able to measure with carbon-14 dating. Problems, serious problems as associated with this, and we can talk about all the other dating methods if you'd like, but if you walked into a room and found a candle burning on the table and I asked you the question, when was it lit? You say, I don't know, it was burning when I walked in. Well, we can do some things to this candle that are called empirical science. Hard, testable, nobody's going to argue with you, science. We can measure the candle. Let's suppose it is seven inches tall. We get all the scientists in the world, we all measure it with you know, incredible, precise instruments, and we all agree it's seven inches tall. How long has it been burning? Anybody know? I won't tell you, will it? Let's do some more empirical science. Let's measure how fast it burns. Let's suppose, after extensive testing, we all agree it's burning an inch an hour. Nobody's going to argue with the fact. Now, who can tell me how long it's been burning? Years. Correct. You got it. <laughs> when was it lit? You can't tell me, unless you're willing to make a few assumptions. Now, here's the assumptions. How tall was it? We have no idea. Has it always burned at the same rate? We have no idea. With carbon dating, we know how much carbon's in the object. That is measured very precisely almost down to the atom. I don't argue with the ability to measure the C14 in a fossil. I don't argue with that. That's probably very correct. But they're assuming how much was in the laboratory always been the same. Has carbon-14 always decayed at the same rate? You mentioned several times this afternoon about potassium-argon dating. 
There have been numerous examples where potassium argon dating has been shown to be wildly wrong. Hawaiian volcanic lava. I was just there a few weeks ago. 1802, the volcano erupted. They, they potassium argon dated it at 3 billion years old, I believe, or some great wild number like that. See, the Bible teaches the earth used to have a protective canopy of water above the atmosphere. This is all gone. It fell down. It's in the oceans today. I can't prove this. This is part of the creation theory. This water would filter out radiation and prevent the formation of most carbon-14. So since our calibration curve today starts at 16, what if they started with two before the flood? If they only had two clicks per minute per gram of carbon on their Geiger counter from carbon-14 before the flood, we would dig them up 4,400 years later and assume they started at 16 and went from 16 to 8 to 4 to 2 to 1, when actually they went from 2 to 1. They're only 4,400 years old, but we think they're 40,000 years old, which is why they get so many wild dates. Here's the documentation if you want to check this out. Living mollusk shells dated at 2,300 years old, Science Volume 141. Freshly killed seal, carbon dated at 1,300 years old. Just killed it. S shells from living snails, carbon dated 27,000 years old. 1984. One part of the Valasovich mammoth, carbon dated 29,000 years old. Another part was 44,000 years old. How old was that mammoth? One part of Dima, the baby mammoth that was found dehydrated, carbon dated at 40,000 years old. Another part was 26,000 years old. And the wood around it was 10,000 years old. Three different dates. This is talking about the same location. The lower leg of the Fairbanks Creek mammoth had a radiocarbon age of 15,380 years while the skin and flesh were 21,300 years. How old was that mammoth? When did it die? Two Colorado Creek mammoths had radiocarbon ages of 22,000 and 16,000, both in the same creek next to each other. So if someone wants to hang all of their eternity on the idea that carbon dating proves the Earth is billions of years old, that I would highly recommend you not do. Uh, carbon dating, though it is an interesting concept, is based on several obvious fundamental assumptions. How much was in that object? If the Earth's atmosphere today contains 16 clicks per minute per gram, you don't know that it's always had that. Matter of fact, we know that it hasn't always had that. Just in the last 50 years since they've measured it, since, since they've measured it, it's increasing. Carbon dating, I think, is an excellent proof that the Earth is not billions of years old, and it's proof it was recently created. It has not yet reached equilibrium. They get wild dates from these, and I can tell you from experience, the dates that they choose to publish are the ones that fit the evolution theory. I don't know about a conspiracy. I don't know if there's a smoke-filled room of professors who are deciding to support evolution. But I think there is a conspiracy with Satan versus God. And I think Satan wants people to believe his lie, that evolution is true and how we got here, so they won't find the Savior. And I must apologize, uh, Dr. Moore. You mentioned that, I don't know if anybody caught the comment, one first thing you started with, this is why you drifted from Christianity years ago. If my demeanor as... Uh, come across as offensive to you, I, I do apologize. This, this subject is near and dear to my heart, and I do get very emotional about this, and I'm sorry, I, you are not the enemy, okay? I would love to see you converted. I told you that on the phone. And I, I'll close here. I think you have been blinded into seeing evidence for microevolution, and somebody somewhere taught you that this proves macroevolution, and you believed it. And I don't know why, but I think I, I would like to convert you from that. And I think you have a profound influence on hundreds or maybe thousands of students over your career here, and which, is, which is great if you're teaching them the truth. But if you're spreading a false religion, then yes, I do get emotional about that when I have to pay for it. I'm sorry about that, but I do apologize. Um. Let me just start uh, uh, by just talking a little bit about radiometric dating, but I, I, I want to do so in a, in a little bit more general sense. Uh, and, and that is that uh, carbon dating is, is actually one of several methodologies. It's the one that's used uh, to date most recent uh, fossil remains. Um, and, and it is based on uh, concepts of radioactive decay and the atomic theory, uh, which tell us, among other things, that uh, decay rates are constant. And uh, this has, of course, been uh, tested experimentally uh, jillions of times, I, I, I suppose. 
but let me come back to the, uh, the example that I cited earlier, the, the nine, uh, the, the moon rock that was divided into nine samples and sent to nine different laboratories, which, which really wasn't. Um, you can't hear me? Um, when you read those nine papers, and mind you, I'm not a geophysicist, uh, but I do read the papers with, as someone who knows the scientific method. I know a good scientific paper when I, when I see it. Um, that first of all, this was sort of an odd set of papers in that they were the first reports of, of lunar rock dates. And one of the interesting aspects of it was that the papers came out of a conference that was held where each of the authors came to the conference with their manuscript written, uh, with their specimens dated, uh, and uh, they hadn't seen one another's data prior to that, that they came blind, essentially. It was, it was a blind experiment. And there was more than one specimen, of course. There were the, some number of kilograms total and a large number of specimens dated in the nine different laboratories, usually by several methods in each laboratory. Uh, and if you read those papers, as I do as a scientist but not a specialist in the area, there is a striking consistency in the dates that come out of them. And that is that there were two populations of rocks collected, essentially. Uh, one dates at about 4.6 or 4.7 billion years, and the other somewhat younger, around 3.6 or 3.7. And the interpretation of the lunar geologists of this was that the older date, 4.6, uh, represents the age of the formation of the moon, the original formation. And the younger date uh, represents uh, the time of the formation of the Sea of Tranquility, where the stones were, were collected. Uh, but the overwhelming sense I had uh, was that the, the conclusions were really remarkably consistent. And if you go to the library and read the literature on radiometric dating, first of all, be prepared to spend a lot of time there. It's a huge literature, and it's very complex, uh, and it'll take you a long time to work your way through it. But it is remarkably consistent, the dates that come from different methods. It is also true that there are bogus dates. And in most instances, it's known precisely why the dates are bogus. Uh, radiometric dating of almost virtually every sort does not work well with metamorphic rocks, uh, for example, the potassium argon method. And that's because as the rock metamorphoses, the argon escapes and you end up with a bogus date. Uh, in, in a methodological sense, I reminded my own research, which involves DNA sequencing, <clears throat> which is a remarkably reliable technique. We use a, a method called the polymerase chain reaction, and then uh, a, which actually amplifies the specific gene we're interested in, and then we sequence it by a method called the dideoxy terminator method. And uh, we take extraordinary precautions when we're in the laboratory. First of all, it takes uh, a long time to reach the level of technical skill that allows you to do this. It takes uh, our students have completed their undergraduate work. They're usually well into their doctoral programs before they begin to sort of come to grips with the theory of this. But in any event, the results we get are very reliable. But occasionally, we get a bad sequence. And uh, the reason we get a bad sequence is that the polymerase chain reaction, which was used, I would imagine, to sequence Monica Lewinsky's dress, uh, among other things, um, is a remarkably powerful method. It starts out literally, or can, with a single gene and amplify it up to a concentration where you can actually do chemistry on it in the laboratory. And as a result of that, 
it is easy to contaminate a sample. This is what a lot of the argumentation in the O.J. Simpson trial swirled around, was the potential of contamination of the polymerase chain reaction. And in my own area, I can even point to two or three examples in the literature published in scientific journals of bad sequences. It happens. It's just the way technology is. But that doesn't mitigate the fact that overwhelmingly the polymerase chain reaction works and it proved to be <clears throat> the smoking gun evidence, as you know, for Bill Clinton. So the same argument in uh, the broader philosophical context when you look at the philosophy of science applies to all the dating methods. If you take the science seriously, if you trust the scientist to the extent that I trust any scientist, you, you, it's just overwhelming that radiometric dating works and the earth is an awful lot older than 6,000 um, 6, years. Um, oh, one final comment I want to make with regard to radiometric dating is, I, as I mentioned to you, I'm a, an evolutionary biologist, a geneticist, I'm not a geophysicist. Uh, Kent is a science educator, his degree is in science education. Uh, to my knowledge, he does not publish scientific papers, is that right? Do you publish scientific papers? Do you work in the laboratory or...? The question is, have I published scientific papers? Yeah, do you work in the laboratory? Have you... <clears throat> Oh, no, sir, no. Yeah. Um, in my case, if you take what I say about uh, radiometric dating, uh, you should take it with the understanding that it's coming uh, from someone who looks at it at a secondary level, and the same would be true uh, for Kent, that in effect you're listening to two charlatans uh, talking about uh, an aspect of science that neither of us knows in sufficient detail to really be talking about it uh, like this. Um, so... Uh, that point. I want to return in the in the few minutes I have left. We keep wandering away from uh, my efforts to find something within the Book of Genesis that would lead to a testable uh, prediction. And what I'm thinking is, um, and I, I hope I'm not beating a dead horse or a dead dinosaur, so to speak, uh, but I want to return to this idea of what a kind is, because, again, if we could determine what that is, and if we are willing to concede that microevolution occurs, which would allow some diversification within kinds, uh, we could actually do a survey of the animal or plant kingdoms or the bacterial kingdoms for that matter, and we could determine whether the genetic diversity uh, between kinds, between species, within species was consistent with the prediction that we derive from the Genesis hypothesis and therefore uh, we could test it. So I have to return to this. And before I, I, I do, if you'll just hold that thought and try to respond to that. Uh, another test that comes to mind um, uh, concerns genetic diversity. Uh, there's a well-known phenomenon in population genetics and evolutionary biology that when a population is reduced to a small size, uh, that much of the genetic variation in the population is lost. And this is thought to be the explanation of the very low genetic diversity among cheetahs, and you can do experiments in the laboratory with Drosophila that demonstrate this very clearly. It is the case, and Genesis is fairly clear about this, uh, that in the flood of Noah, that species pairs were put on the ark two by two. Actually, there's a distinction between clean animals and unclean animals, and I'm not sure what that is, but uh, unclean animals were brought on two by two, and yes, clean animals, I think in pairs of seven or six or something, like, I, I don't remember exactly. And that with regard to the human population or human sample on the ark, uh, there was no one as wife, uh, his three sons and their wives. 
Now, this is a population bottleneck, which according to the Genesis hypothesis occurred 4,000 years ago. And among other things, it would mean that there was only a single Y chromosome, that is Noah's male sex-determining chromosome. And I haven't done the calculations exactly, but we could. I mean, we could actually test this hypothesis. We could calculate how much genetic diversity there should be in modern populations, applying the uniformitarian principle of science, which I claim is essential if you're doing science, which would be to base it on mutation rates that we measure in the laboratory. And we could calculate what the genetic diversity of human populations ought to be. And where we want to look first, as I said, is at the Y chromosome, uh, then the mitochondrial genome, because it's transmitted only through the females. We'd have even a smaller bottleneck there. And then we would want to look at the nuclear genes. But I claim, without having the data in hand, that the genetic diversity in human populations vastly exceeds a bottleneck of that sort. If we had really gone through the Noachan bottleneck, then heart transplants would not be near the problem they are today. The problem with uh, all tissue transplants, heart transplants, liver transplants, uh, has to do with the enormous diversity of the major histocompatibility genes. There are more histocompatibility alleles uh, than it seems plausible could have come through that bottleneck. And not only that, there are histocompatibility genes within humans that are more similar to histocompatibility genes within gorillas than they are to other histocompatibility genes in humans. There's this enormous diversity, and I don't understand how that could have come through uh, the bottleneck of that size. So I want you to address the problem of defining kinds such that we can look at how genetic diversity ought to be partitioned between kind species and within species and then address this problem uh, of the seemingly excessive genetic variation. Okay, I'd be glad to do that. We've got quite a few questions that have come in, right? Yeah, if you don't mind, um, we appreciate all that you all have done and, and we all enjoyed it very much. I'd like Maybe we give them all a big hand. <laughs> If you would take just a, a moment, Dr. Hoven, to respond, and then I will I have a few questions from the audience. Uh, what I would ask in advance is, uh, in, in an effort to get some questions through, um, if you could keep your responses, both of you, down to about three minutes so we can get a few questions through, I'd certainly appreciate it. And for the audience, we'd appreciate it if you'd uh, hold your response until the end to give us optimal time for these questions. Thank you. Okay, uh, you asked what is a kind. I've said, told you several times I don't know for sure. If I had to pick something, I would I guess I would say it's closer to our current divisions of family as opposed to species. Uh, you've never given a definition of species, uh, and you, you've made a big deal about making, make, you have made a big deal about making predictions, yet the evolutionists do not make predictions. I will give you some predictions based on the Genesis account. I would predict that because of this worldwide flood, we should find lots of fossils all over the world, zillions of them, things that are dead. We should find layers of coal and natural gas and oil from the plants and animals that were buried in this flood. We should find sedimentary rock over most of the earth. We should find fossil seashells on top of major mountain ranges all over the world. That's a prediction, which obviously is true. I mean, everybody knows, I and mean, that's the way it is. So I think that's a reasonable prediction from Genesis. Uh, you mentioned about Noah taking species on the ark. I didn't use the word species, and he didn't use the word species, and God didn't use the word species. God says two of every sort and two of every kind. Sorts and kinds are the only words used to describe these animals. So your, your, your whole effort seems to be to try to box somebody into a corner to make a definition of kind, when yet you're, you're not willing to do that on species. And then if somebody did make a definition of kind, like I said, okay, if I had to, I would say probably more like a family, you will then devote enormous amounts of research to determine um, you know, how that could be wrong, and yet you won't devote the same amount of research to devote... To, to study how your idea could be wrong of evolution. It's very uh, one-sided here. It seems to be more anti-creation than it is pro-science. Uh, I would point out, as far as the bottleneck of coming through Noah's family at the flood, 
all of us coming from a rock is an enormous bottleneck. Uh, which is what the evolutionist ultimately believes. We all came from a single common ancestor. You talk about a bottleneck. Uh, that's just simply not possible. Uh, you mentioned about the carbon dating. Uh, you may be aware that when L Richard Leakey found the skull, KNM ER 1470, found 1972, it looked like modern humans, but it was found under the KBS tuft. Now, the KBS tuft had already been dated by potassium argon dating from Nature magazine, April 18th, 1970, page 226. It had been dated at 212 million years old. This date had been verified several different ways. Everybody accepted the date of the KBS tuft at 212 million years old until they found the human skull underneath. The only way they knew the potassium argon date was wrong was the fossils didn't match the theory. So evolution, assumption, was the driving force to change the date of the KBS tuft. It was dated numerous times. There's quite an article about it in here. Ten samples were dated and ranged from 0.52 million to 2.64 million, a wide range of dates. And there's all the data right here. I'd be glad to uh, I'll let you see this afterwards. So I think it'd be, a, it'd be a false characterization to say that carbon dating is consistent or that anything about it is consistent. The theory of evolution and the assumption of how old the thing should be based on the layer it's in, that drives the consistency because only the dates that agree with the theory are published. Well, that's not science. That's, uh, you can, they did the same thing in the Soviet Union. Get in, find a teacher 10 years ago, and get a teacher and put him in the, in the Soviet classroom 10 years ago, have him stand up and say, boys and girls, um, I don't think communism works. I think capitalism is a better theory. Well, what would happen to that teacher? Well, he'd be shoveling snow in Siberia if he survived. And I would be willing to make a prediction that if a teacher in this university stood up and said in their class, I don't think evolution, the macroevolution, is a reasonable theory. I think it's never been observed. It's purely a religion. I think creation's a better explanation for how we got here. He wouldn't be shot or go to Siberia, but he'd probably lose his job. I That's would just... be willing to bet the $10,000 you have on the table that that wouldn't happen if the faculty member had tenure, even if he didn't. I, it, it simply Are wouldn't. Are you familiar with Dean Kenyon at Stanford University? Dean Kenyon wrote books about evolution. He was a strong supporter of evolution. He got converted and became a creationist. He wrote the book of Pandas and People. They tried to fire him, but he was already tenured. Stanford University, they made him a lab assistant. Call Dean Kenyon and ask him if there's any prejudice against creationists. Do you? 10,000. Do you? Um, do I get time to? If you wouldn't mind, uh, I'd give me, just give like me to give you. 15 seconds. All right. Uh, which, again, is I caution you to check the factoids always, mine as well as Kent's. I agree. And I, I would be willing, I'd be interested in talking to uh, Dean Kenyon if you'll give me his phone number, or email, or, or address. Sure. And I can give you a list of others who've been censored over creationist teaching. But anyway, let's take some of the questions here. A um, couple questions from the audience, and once again, just for, so that we can get a couple of these through, we'd like to ask that you limit your answers to about three minutes. The first question is directed to Dr. Hoven. Uh, the question is that you, you keep stating that evolution is a religion. Uh, in order to help uh, explain this, could you please give us a definition of religion and explain how evolution fits into this definition? Um. I would say a religion, by that I mean something you have to believe in without any empirical scientific evidence. I guess I would contrast science, things that we can observe, test, demonstrate, with religion as in something we have to believe in, that you cannot see it or observe it, for instance. Um, so I guess that may be a loose definition of religion. Uh, Webster's dictionary definition is a religion is uh, belief in a divine creator or creators uh, that brought the universe into being. So the evolution theory is a, a belief in how the universe came to be. So it, it fits all the criteria of a religion with the Webster's Dictionary definition. Dr. Moore, a response perhaps at why it is not a religion? Uh, yeah, uh, the theory of evolution by natural selection is not a religion because it's falsifiable. Uh, and it has, um, even beyond that, it, it is a uh, valid scientific theory in that, that it uh, has withstood numerous tests uh, of its falsifiability. I can conceive of, 
data right now that we might gather that would convince me uh, uh, that, or would in effect falsify the, the, the theory. And um, it would have to do with um, finding this pervasive pattern of homology among genes. Uh, again, when the molecular era, the, the era of molecular genetics um, dawned on us, uh, it, it was conceivable that we would begin to look at genes and that we would find that there was no pattern of relatedness among them. And if that had been the case, I would have given up the idea of evolution immediately. And I want to mention another point that we, we really should talk about and we haven't, and that is what empirical evidence is. It seems to me as there's an abundance of empirical evidence, uh, not only for macroevolution, but for the connection between macro and microevolution. And so in order to say that macroevolution is not a science, or that it's a religion, we, we, we need to find out what the empirical evidence is that Kent and other creationists would accept that would falsify it as a scientific theory and would move it across Popper's line of demarcation from science to religion. It seems to me like the empirical evidence is overwhelming uh, in support of an evolution theory. What you're referring to in, is empirical evidence. In support evidence. of macroevolution in particular. You think, there's, you think there's empirical evidence for macroevolution? Is that what you said? I didn't catch that last time. Yes, I think there's overwhelming uh, empirical... Would you, would you please give me an example? Okay. Um, would you consider humans and chimps two distinct kinds? I would consider humans and chimps two distinct kinds, absolutely. Then why is there this uh, level of genetic similarity between the two? Uh, but I really don't need to ask you that question. Uh, the oh, I'd like to have the question. The, the challenge is, though, uh, is that a test of a prediction of evolution theory? And evolution theory predicts that all species uh, arose from previously existing ancestral species, and that means that they not only acquired their uh, anatomy by a process of modification through evolution from the common ancestor, and so one should see homology at that level. But you should see homology at the genetic level as well. And moreover, if independently we had a phylogeny that told us that there was a particular order in which a particular set of species arose, based on anatomical studies, and so it's independent of the molecular data, then molecular data comes along decades later, and we use that to generate a phylogeny in the same way, and the two are identical. Uh, I consider that strong support for a continuity, and this is really what the test of macroevolution is. It's continuity versus discontinuity across kinds. Dr. Um, the humans and chimps, I would say, are different kinds of animals. I would you know, not argue there are literally thousands and thousands of differences. You chose to look at the DNA sequence uh, between humans and chimps, and it is a certain percentage of similarity there. I could point out that a watermelon is 97% uh, water, and a cloud is 100% water, only 3% difference, and a snow cone is 98% water, as is a jellyfish, by the way. So snow cones and jellyfish are identical if you want to make the water content the criteria. If you're wanting to make the DNA the criteria for humans and chimps, that's fine. There are a lot of similarities. To me, it's pretty obvious there's a common designer. I would say there's thousands of similarities between different computer programs that are all produced by Microsoft. Not because they all evolved, you know, from hieroglyphics, but because the same guys are designing these programs. That's why. And so that's why there's such a similarity between the, amino, between the, uh, the DNA sequencing of the animals. And by the way, if you want to compare the eyeball, then the humans are closest to an octopus. If you want to compare uh, cytochrome C, then we're closest to a sunflower. Uh, if you want to compare the milk, uh, where the human milk that's produced is closest to an ass, a jackass. So it depends what you want to compare. Uh, what, the, what the evolutionists have done is they've taken uh, the example that they think fits the theory and ignored all the evidence that does not fit the theory. Uh, the humans, for instance, have a Broca's convolution, a section of the brain that allows us to speak. Apes have no such uh, section. 
the foot structure is absolutely totally different. You know, they have a grasping foot where we do not. Uh, apes cannot, apes and chimps, neither one can touch all their fingers to their thumb. I would say the hair distribution on the body is pretty obviously different um, in some cases. Uh, so I, it depends what you want to compare. I would point out that the Honda Prelude and the Honda Accord have thousands of similarities and probably thousands of interchangeable parts. But that doesn't prove they came from a Chevy. It proves they came from the same designer. So the evidence you're giving is classic. It can be used just as well as evidence for creation. So I don't see why I should have to pay for your particular interpretation of this evidence to be taught to all the kids as science, when it's simply your religion. It's something you believe. Doc, Dr. Hoven, uh, another question addressed at you. The question is based on first principles. If the first principles of religion uh, begin with God, um, how did God come into being? And if God wasn't created, then does this imply the possibility that matter can, in fact, create itself? Well, the, there really are only two options that anybody's been able to figure out. Somebody created the universe, or it created itself. The only ones with a third option are those out there on the lunatic fringe who would say, we're not really here at all. We just think we're here. Uh, we are here. And everything we see is winding down. We see stars blow up, you know, nova or supernova. We see everything, everything degenerating. So that would say there must have been a beginning. And just the simple concept of, of uh, geometry, you know, with inf infinity. If matter is infinitely old, and if time is indeed eternal, if time has always been here, then you really couldn't get to today because when did it start? I mean, just the fact that we are here today proves there was a beginning. There has to be a beginning to this time. The Bible is very clear in Genesis chapter 1. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. The beginning is a reference to time. God started time. In the beginning, God created the heaven, a reference to space. God created time and space and matter. Those three are a continuum. One cannot exist without the other. You cannot have matter without space. You cannot have matter and space without time. The three had to come into existence simultaneously. Now, the fact that God is outside of that and is beyond my comprehension makes him worthy of worship. Dr. Morrow, response? Uh, yeah, I... Uh, my, my response, I mean, this is a question that... Uh, it sort of comes in on a, on a, on a personal level, and uh, so I have to, to, to sort of answer it on on, uh, on that level. I guess I would start by saying, um, in direct response to the question, which was, where did, what if, is God? If, if, if God came into being without the, the effect of a creator, doesn't that demonstrate the possibility that matter can, in fact, create itself? Yeah, I, I simply haven't a clue. How, how can it, how can how can anyone know that? Um, and I'm one of those uh, people um, who, uh, for whom, um, logical consistency is is very important. And uh, I am a scientist in my thought processes at home, uh, as well as in my laboratory and office. And um, the nature of God, the nature of the beginning, falls outside of the scientific method. I mean, the science just doesn't, doesn't deal with that. Uh, and because I practice science uh, in my thinking at all times, uh, I'm necessarily an agnostic. It, it's, it's the only logical conclusion, it seems to me, that one can come to. There's no way of knowing uh, the nature of God. And I... I counsel those of you who, who follow our religious faith um, that you be aware of the diversity of religions uh, and that many, many people uh, have very distinct concepts of God and the nature of things than you do, and uh, that somehow, among other things, you have to have come to trust your own belief system and those that are leading you, and uh, I think you should be very, very wary of, of that. Um, 
One, one last question, and uh, then there will be some closing marks, and I believe we will break for some fellowship. Uh, this question was addressed to Dr. Moore specifically, and that is uh, Darwin essentially believed that given enough time, the fossil record would fill in the gaps, and yet, as we've heard today, that hasn't actually happened. As a scientist, how do you relegate your views and your beliefs in evolution with the fact that there are still missing links? Yeah, th that's simply a misconception of uh, what, what Darwin said. Um, Darwin, like virtually, in fact, Darwin is, is in many ways the founding father of this concept that the fossil record is very incomplete uh, and will never be filled in completely. Uh, we know, among other things, from the processes of fossilization that there are certain kinds of organisms that simply don't fossilize well. Uh, I have the misfortune of working on one of the groups that do not fossilize well, uh, birds, because they have uh, small, fragile, thin bones, and many of them are forest-dwelling dwell species that when they die, they fall on acidic soils and they simply perish uh, before they can become mineralized. And so no one anticipate anticipated or anticipates that the fossil record is, is, is going to be filled in. Uh, I would point out also, and, and let me state it this way, that if there were no fossil record at all, and this is plausible, I mean, it's really a rare event that results in the fossilization of a dead animal, and it's entirely conceivable that there would be no fossil record. Uh, I would argue that we still would have discovered evolution, that evolution as a theory does not rely on the fossil record. And I restate that the fossil record, uh, as it exists, as poor as it is, is completely consistent with the theory of evolution and highly inconsistent uh, with the Genesis hypothesis because of the stratigraphy and the dates, which I've mentioned before. Dr. Hovind? Yes. Um, I appreciate you stating that no one anticipates the fossil record will be filled in. And yet there are literally trillions and trillions of fossils in the world. To say that fossilization is a rare event is true uh, today, but the very existence of these trillions of fossils, I was just in Lompoc, California, in the diatomaceous earth quarry out there, where they find in unbelievable volumes of fossils. The Karoo Formation in Africa, they estimate, has 800,000 million, 800,000 billion, or 800 trillion fossils of vertebrate animals in one formation in Africa. The existence of fossils is not the problem, folks. The existence of intermediate fossils is the problem which I think the fossil record is clear evidence. The animals were created after their kind. There's never been an exception to that. We don't find any evidence of the trillions of fossils available that shows there's been any change from one kind of animal to another. If you want to go with a species, there might be some evidence that there's been you know, uh, some speciation, but I don't know that I would like to use that word. I stick with the word kind. Um, and to say that the fossil record is consistent with the theory is just simply not true. Stephen Gould said, and Niles Eldridge said, and you yourself said tonight, you follow the idea of neo-Darwinism, which, if I understand what you're saying, is the punctuated equilibrium model of Stephen no, Gould. That, no, 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 that's incorrect. Do I you, meant to, to okay, correct do, that earlier. But, okay, uh, do you agree with Stephen Gould, then, that the fossil record does not show intermediates, therefore evolution must have happened in jumps, in small populations? Uh, do I have 10 minutes to, <laughs> to sorry, address no. it? To, to address that question, I mean, one cannot address Steve Gould in any less than 10 minutes. It's, well, let's get Steve Gould back. The people, people, the sponsored, people that were here when Steve Gould was here and offered to, have, to let me come debate him, and he refused. I would be glad to do that also. You know, I'm just a high school science teacher, that's all. I'm not no great scientist, but I'm sick and tired of this propaganda being pushed off on these kids, that's all. Um, I'd like to thank both of you again for your time and your insights do, for us today. Do we get any sort of a final, just a closing yeah, one minute statement? Yes, absolutely. Um, That's what I was just going to say. If you wanted to just wrap up, and then um, Jason Raju from InterVarsity will have some closing remarks and we'll break. So, Dr. Moore, if you'd like to begin. Very good. Do you want to speak first? Do you want to make a. Doesn't matter. Oh, sure, I will. If you like. Um, I think the creation view is very simple. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Not very long ago, by you know, 6,000 years is a long time, but that's, you know, not compared to the billions. 
I think the fossil evidence is overwhelming. There was a worldwide flood. We find layers of strata all over the world, sometimes several thousand feet thick, as in the Grand Canyon or other places like that. I think the evidence from, that we see in the fossils and the evidence of the strata of the earth is evidence of a worldwide flood. God judged this world, and Satan doesn't want you to look at the strata and see God's judgment, because then you might fear judgment day for yourself and get ready for that. Satan's got you blinded into thinking that the fossil evidence is proof for evolution, when actually it's great proof for creation and a judgment of God. The fossil evidence, the oil, the coal formation, the natural gas, it's all evidence there was a, there was a judgment on this world, and it's coming again. And you better get ready for that, and God loves you. I have a very hard time finding opponents for debates, especially a second debate with the same opponent. That is just about doesn't happen. I would be honored, uh, Dr. Moore, to debate you. I appreciate your, your kind uh, manner. You didn't get hostile and yell. And it's a very emotional subject with me, obviously, but I'm trying to stay calm. But I would be honored to debate you again, or you and Stephen Gould together, or you and any 10 other evolutionists you can get. I would like to see some scientific evidence for the macroevolution concept. And until there is some, I would like it removed from the schools. It's just a religion that people believe in. And I'm, I fear that if you continue following that and don't trust Christ as your Savior, you'll go to the hell that you may or may not believe in. I don't want that for you, okay? God loves you. Thank you so much. Dr. Moore. Um, well, I thank you, first of all, for your concern. Um, I guess I would start by saying deja vu all over again. Um, we're beginning to talk about teaching evolution, teaching creation in the schools. And this is an issue that's been debated over and over and over again in this country. It's actually not often debated in other countries, but in this country it is. Uh, and it's because the First Amendment of the Bill of Rights of the United States Constitution uh, has established this barrier between uh, church and government, and uh, that has continuously been interpreted to mean uh, that religions cannot be promulgated in the school, and uh, the definitive decisions um, were actually, the, the, the definitive Supreme Court decision was made, as I recall, in 1987 involving a case in Louisiana. Uh, and earlier, a very important decision about 1981 or 82 in Arkansas. And in both those cases, the federal judges uh, determined that what was then being promulgated as uh, creation science and is now being promulgated uh, by Kent Hovind is not evidence against evolution, but rather uh, fundamentalist Christianity repackaged. And they ruled, therefore, that it could not be taught in schools. And I'm sure that will continue to be the case. Uh, I am concerned about the political overtones, uh, or maybe I should say the political undercurrents that uh, are associated with creationism, with fundamental Christian fundamentalism today. Um, I, like most Americans, believe that uh, you can believe whatever you want. It, it really is not my concern. Um, but when it becomes a political movement, it does concern me. And I would be inclined to say at, at, at this point, and I, and I will, that there really is at some level, it depends on how you work it out in your own mind, uh, no conflict between science and religion. I know many deeply religious people who are evolutionary biologists who have reinterpreted uh, the book of Genesis, they have taken it as a work of literature, uh, they have taken it as an allegory, and they have uh, been able to understand evolution in context, e evolution as well as Christianity in the context of Genesis. So that's a possibility. Um, but, and I, I would say further that there really is a large separation between science and religion. There's a large set of questions that science simply doesn't address, and they have to do with what one ought to do, 
what is morally right and what is morally wrong. And up until a few years ago, I'm sure we would have found that if you wrote down your moral values and my moral values, that they'd be nearly identical. And I suspect they would be nearly identical today. There's a few issues we would disagree on. And the most prominent of those is the nature of homosexuality and what Christian fundamentalists think about it. For the most part, I would say that science, and particularly evolution, has absolutely nothing to say about morals. But this is one area where it seems to me as though science, and particularly evolution, perhaps can provide some guidance specifically that to be homosexual, to have a sexual orientation uh, that is not specified in the Bible, that is condemned in the Bible, may in fact be normal. And that what fundamental, Christian fundamentalists are beginning to do now in attacking and criticizing homosexuals is becoming very political in what I view as a very sinister way. And I caution you to think very, very carefully about your faith and the prophets that you're following. Well, folks, this is where the debate ended. I uh, hate to have it end on a note like that. Uh, the Bible certainly teaches that homosexuali homosexuality is a sin, along with overeating and drinking and many other things. So. I think oftentimes Christians tend to condemn homosexuality and they don't condemn their own sins. But it is a sin. Uh, God loves the homosexuals. They can be forgiven. They can be saved. But this is not something that should be condoned or tolerated. It is definitely a violation of God's law. And so we hope you enjoyed this debate. We'd like to challenge you or encourage you to get a list of our other materials. We've produced a lot of videos on creation, evolution, dinosaurs, and those kind of things. And we'd be glad to send you a catalog. Or you can get things off our website, drdino.com. And we think the things that help strengthen your faith in the Word of God. If you'd like to trust Christ as your Savior, if you're not sure you're going to heaven, let me encourage you right now to just realize, first of all, that you're a sinner. The Bible says in Romans chapter 3 and verse 23, For all have sinned and come short to the glory of God. The Bible also says because of our sins we deserve to die and go to hell. God doesn't want you to go to hell. I don't want you to go to hell. Only the devil wants you to go to hell. But we deserve it, and I deserve it. We deserve hell because we have broken God's laws. We have disobeyed. And that's why Jesus Christ came and died on the cross. He loves you so much. He wants you to come to heaven. Even after we disobeyed God and left him and deserted his, his will for our life, he still came to try to win us back. He died on the cross. His blood is available to pay for your sins if you'll just ask him. February 9, 1969, I prayed a simple little prayer. I just said, Lord, I'm a sinner. Would you please forgive me and save me? Please come into my heart and be my Lord. Amen. That's what I prayed in February 9, 1969. And I've got God's promise I'm going to heaven because it says in Romans chapter 10 and verse 13, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. If you just prayed and asked the Lord to save you, why don't you call or write or email us and tell us that you gave your heart to Jesus Christ. We'll be glad to rejoice with you. If you'd like to call, I'll be honored to talk with you personally. I'm usually in the office Thursdays and Fridays, and we'll be glad to answer any questions I can to help you grow in your faith. Thanks so much for joining us. Do you want to know more about how to combat the godless theory of evolution? Creation Science Evangelism offers four great tools that help strengthen the faith of believers and win the lost to Christ. After 15 years of teaching high school science, Dr. Hoven began Creation Science Evangelism in 1989. We are a ministry that is dedicated to providing tools which will help you combat the evolution philosophy that is destroying the faith of millions every year. The first tool Creation Science offers is their powerful, life-changing video series. Over the last 12 years, well over a million videotapes of Dr. Hoven's seminar have circled the globe. They are reaping a harvest of souls for the kingdom of Christ, as well as helping restore the faith of many thousands confused by the evolution propaganda to which they've been subjected. These videos are available in English, Russian, French, Spanish, Japanese, and sign language. The Age of the Earth, first of the seven-part series, teaches that God created the universe about 6,000 years ago in six literal days. Could this be true? Can it be scientifically proven that the Earth is not billions of years old? 
This tape gives solid scientific evidence that the Earth is young and that the Bible is scientifically accurate. How did the environment of the original creation differ from ours today? And how would this allow men to live over 900 years? Can Christians have a good explanation for the existence of dinosaurs? Could some dinosaurs still be alive today? These and many more questions are covered in the second and third part of the series. Evolution has permeated public school textbooks with false and fraudulent information. This video exposes nearly 30 lies commonly found in textbooks. Every public school student, teacher, and school board member needs to watch part four of this series. Find out if you have been lied to in your textbooks. Discover the terrible difference evolutionary beliefs have made in the past as well as in recent history in our video number five. Dictators throughout time have used their evolution-based philosophies to rationalize their brutal actions. Learn how evolution propaganda is being used today to prepare people for the new world order. This is just a taste of all the information the 17-hour seminar series has to offer. Also available are college courses that expand on the seminars in great detail. For those who can handle a more confrontational atmosphere, our debate series is just for you. I said, now, Mr. Patterson, if you think the tailbone is a vestigial, I, Kent Hovind, will pay to have yours removed. Dr. Hovind has debated a wide range of atheists and evolutionists all over the country. And you're sure to find these 12 debates very exciting. These would be perfect to present to that scientifically minded person who likes to argue their point. Our topical series includes exciting topics like why evolution is stupid, public school presentation, children's video about dinosaurs, the Bible and health, Leviathan, the fire-breathing dragon, and many more. Creation Science also offers a variety of visuals, like the longevity chart, which presents the entire lineage of Adam to Joseph as given in Genesis. It's exciting to see exactly how many generations were alive at the same time. Hundreds of books on a variety of subjects, videos on incredible creatures that defy evolution, t-shirts, fossils, and more. Make Creation Science Evangelism the one-stop shopping center for your creation material needs. Our two websites, www.drdino.com and www.dinosauradventureland.com, provide our second tool for evangelism. drdino.com is packed with lots of information, from charts and graphs to articles and frequently asked questions. This is also where you will find more information on all of the products CSE has to offer. dinosauradventureland.com is great for the kids. They can play lots of fun games and see unusual rides and activities located at Dinosaur Adventureland in Pensacola, Florida. Thousands visit our sites regularly to gain insight into God's creation. The third tool available to you is the live seminars conducted by Dr. Hovind and his son Eric. Since 1989, Dr. Hovind has held seminars and debates in hundreds of churches, schools, and universities in 49 states and 30 foreign countries. His fast-paced, illustrated seminars cover diverse topics such as evidence for a young earth, how long Adam lived, dinosaurs living with man, where races came from, radiometric dating, and much more. Our fourth tool is the new exciting dinosaur adventure land. Many thousands have come from all across America to visit our museum, creation bookstore, science center, and theme park, where God gets the glory for science. Our unusual swings, rides, and activities each have a science lesson as well as a spiritual lesson and captivate everyone from age 4 to 94. To order material, find out how to schedule a seminar at your church or get more information about Dinosaur Adventureland, write to us at Creation Science Evangelism, 29 Cummings Road, Pensacola, Florida, 32503, or call us at 850-479-3466, or toll free in the U.S., 877-479-3466.